namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa So another week is upon us, some new faces, some old faces, some really old faces. Time's doing a fantastic job, that much I can tell from where I'm sitting. Nature does a fantastic job. As a matter of fact, everything does a fantastic job. They do their job. The oceans, they do their jobs. The rivers, they do their jobs. The wind that flows, how oh, it does its job. There's not a single fault to be found. The mountains, they do a perfect job. The rain does a fantastic job. The suns and the stars and the moons, oh, they do, they do a lovely job. And they operate like clockwork. They all do a fantastic job. Whatever their purpose was in coming into being, they serve their purpose. like clockwork. Without fail, the rains will wet the grounds. Without fail, the winds will blow, bringing with it coolness and a soothing effect on everyone it touches. Without fail, the weather, you know, spring, summer, autumn, winter, all of these seasons, they come and go without fail. When was the last time we didn't have winter? Now it comes every year. Yeah, perhaps in countries like this, you know, it's not so obvious, but there's still winter. They come and go. The globe turns on its axis without fail. The sun rises without fail. The moon rises without fail. Orion's in the sky, how often? Every night, without fail. It happens to be then that everything does its, jo does its job, serves its purpose without fail. Except for one particular being. How often do the seagulls fly south? Every year. How often does a woodpecker build its nest? Every year. When it's time to lay its eggs, it will do that every year. It's just this human race. We humans appear to be the only kind of species which forget our purpose. Even inanimate things like the skies and the stars and the moons and the earth, right? they, all do it. they all do their purpose, they all serve their purpose, they do their job, and what a fantastic job they do. But we human beings, because we have been blessed, or some might argue cursed, with choice, the choice to make decisions, with intellect, we can choose what to do next, what to do now, what to do tomorrow. We can choose. Because we have been blessed, or as I say, some argue cursed, we don't seem to be fulfilling our purpose. 
a puppy that comes into this world from its mother's womb never gives up it'll try to stand on its four legs four little legs without fail it'll keep trying until it does so have you ever heard of a puppy who gave up trying to stand on its four legs ever heard of a calf who gave up now nah, can't be bothered i've tried it a couple of times it doesn't work now nah, give up i'm not going to run i'm never going to stand on my four legs i'm never going to stand on my limbs so i give up ever heard of a calf who did that no it doesn't work like that these animals they serve their purpose whatever purpose they have come into this world to do they will do it without fail see it seems quite ironical that when gifted with choice it doesn't seem like a gift because we misuse that gift we forget that we have come to this world with a purpose we forget our purpose and half the time that's why, that's actually because we get to associate others who have lost their purpose in life who have forgotten their purpose in life a donkey no matter how many times or how long you keep a donkey in between dogs it's never going to learn to bark is always going to bray because that's what a donkey does and a dog no matter how often and for how long you keep a dog among lions it's never going to roar it's only going to bark but we humans we are very different keep a human being among other humans for long enough he or she is going to turn out to be the average of the people that he or she is surrounded by yes or no absolutely if you associate the wrong kind of crowd for long enough and how long is long enough <laughs> doesn't take very long just think about some of the habits you might have picked up just having been around the, that kind of crowd You know if you pick around people who think it's okay to pick their noses in public you start doing that pretty soon the only reason that you don't pick your nose in public is because you are around people your parents said aha uh-huh, you're not supposed to do that if you want to do that there's the washroom get in there do what you got to do and then come out don't do that in public that's the only reason you don't do that but be around the kind of people who do that in public and oh you'll soon enough start picking up that habit If you slurp when you drink your tea be around that kind of people then you'll start doing that it's just habit it's not about whether it's right or wrong you just pick up that habit be around people who are angry you'll be someone who gets angry be around people who justify anger pretty soon you're going to justify anger being angry be around people who lie all the time pretty soon you're going to be i'm a liar <clears throat> think about the habits that you have picked up along the way some of these habits you'll be proud of there'll be others you're ashamed of your temperament is the constitution of all of these habits put together all these behaviors that you have picked up if you surround yourself with people who are generous you will also become someone who is generous this is why for humans among all other creatures it is so important who you surround yourself with there's no other being for whom or for which this is more important than humans because we are so easily influenced we are so easily influenced if you hang around you know, why did your parents say puta don't hang around with those kids it's not good for you 
if your parents knew that, you know, you had a bunch of friends at school who smoked, who took drinks, then they said, don't hang around with them. They're the bad crowd. Keep away from them. But you've got a puppy at home, right? The master at home, he takes alcohol. The dog at home, he sees the master taking alcohol. When was the last time the dog came and said, can I have one as well, sir? When was the last time he came and said, cheers? No, you see, they don't get influenced like that. But you do. If you take alcohol today, if you're a smoker, then this is all because of the kind of crowd you, in, you were influenced by, the people you hung around with. Why do you eat, why do you like spicy food? Because that's the kind of people you hung around with. Why do you have a sweet tooth? That's because that's the kind of people you hang around with. See, from very simple things to big things, you are influenced by the people you hang around with. There's good in that and there's bad in that. If you hang around the right crowd, then good, good for you. But equally, if you hang around the wrong crowd, if you hang around with the wrong kind of people, then that's terrible. The consequences can be dire. I have often asked you to think and reflect about the five people you spend most of your time with. It's not something you can just do today and then forget about it. You know what? You've got to do it at least once every three months to realign yourself. At least once every three months, stop for a moment and ask yourself, who are the people I spend most of my time with? It may be that after work, it's become a habit now to go out for a drink right? after work. Work finishes at five, six o'clock, everyone's at the pub. That may have become a habit now. So if you hang around people who, for whom it is a habit to hit the pub after work, then that's who you're going to be pretty soon. So at least every three months, take a stop and take stock of who you are and ask yourself, am I proud about who I have become? This is so important. And the reason for this being so important is that you can be influenced just like that. It only takes one TV advert to influence you. So if, only, if it only takes one TV advert, and how long are TV adverts? Average, a minute, half a minute. And right? very rarely do you get a TV advert that's, more, that's longer than a minute. It only takes one, one viewing of a TV advert. Last time, last I heard, if you see a TV advert or some kind of advertisement, a commercial, that gives you some kind of idea and you are convinced that what you have heard is true, or if you accept that, it's going to take a total of 17 times to convince you otherwise, to convince you that the opposite is true, a total of 17 times. So for example, if I've got a brand of toothpaste, and I show you that advert and I go, this is the best toothpaste that's out there. The other advertisers, other tooth, toothpaste manufacturers or advertisers will have to advertise their product at least 17 times before you are convinced that no, actually there's a better one. So this is why TV is full of adverts. This is why when you walk along the streets, there are posters all around you. Have you ever seen a, a wall in Sri Lanka that hasn't got posters stuck on it? One day it says, stick no bills. Next day it just says, no bills. Following day it just says, bills. The following day, where's that notice that was there on there? That's because what people want to do is to keep conveying that message to you. 
to influence you. Why? Because you can be influenced. You know, in your industries, whatever profession you are in, you will have studied about these things. You know, if you work in, in a job in some kind of company, you will be taught about influencing skills. I learned influencing skills. How do you influence someone to do something that you want them to do? It was a case of make them want and then you can step back. Not get them to do what you want, make them want. Make them want it and then you can step back. How do you know a good salesman? How do you tell a good salesman? A good salesman makes you want it. A good salesman is not someone who comes up to you and says, hey, this is good, buy it. No, a good salesman is someone who will make you want to get down on your knees and beg for it from him or her. That's who a good salesman is. So when I learned influencing skills, this is what I learned. Get the other person to want what it is that you have to offer. And then you don't have to sell it. You already sold it. So that being the case, folks, I can't emphasize enough why I say every three months at least take stock of the people you hang around with. Because your lives are so dynamic as opposed to mine. My life doesn't change a lot. Right? I'm in these four walls, hopefully till my death. And the kind of people hang, I hang around with are going to be the same. Probably the three or four people that I, I hang around with is going to be the same forever. Until, until my death, until my last days. But your lives are so dynamic. Your lives change. If you change work, if you, if you move home, you get, make new friends. You've got to do, this, do these things, right? All day, every day, you make new friends. You change, you move home. Uh, you change jobs. You go abroad. Change school. These are all life events which can bring a huge impact, which can make a huge impact on your direction of life if you have not decided what your purpose in life is. This is why every three months I urge you to take stock and realign yourself to your purpose. Because six months is too late. A year is too late. Remember, you're spending something you can never get back. When time is gone, it's gone. It's not like money. It's not something you can spend and earn more of it. Once it's gone, it's gone. Take a moment now and think about the five people you spend most of your time with. You are the average of all of their behaviors, their habits and their temperaments. You are the average of the five people you spend most of your time with. If you are a kind person, then most of the people that you hang around with are kind people. If you find that you are angry all the time, you get angry a lot of the time, then the five people you spend most of your time with will generally be angry people. If you are happy most of the time, then the five people that you spend most of your time with are generally happy. If you are a smoker, then the five people you spend most of your time with are generally smokers. Is that not the case? Think about the five people you spend most of your time with. That could be at the workplace, it could be at home, it could be at school, it could be your friends. If it's at home, then there's very little you can do about it. Because you can't pick your family. You get given a family. But the rest of it you can pick. You can pick and choose. You can pick and choose the friends you spend your time with. 
If you're not proud about the person you are, if you're not proud about the behaviors and the habits that you possess today, well, you can change it. The five people that you spend the last week with does not have to be, do not have to be the five people you spend the rest of your time with, next week with. You can change. Because you see, the five people you spend most of your time with will, inf will influence how you spend something that you can never get back. This is why it's important. They can influence how you spend something that you can never get back. If you want to be a rich person, who do you hang around with? The poor people? Hmm? No, you hang around rich people. You walk like they walk. You talk like they talk. You go to the clubs that they go to. You hang around them to take a lesson or two out of their books. You watch the TV programs that they watch. You read the books that they read. If you want to be a rich person, that's what you ought to do. Because they influence you. If you're poor today and you want to be rich, find out the things that poor people do and, and don't do them. Find out the things that rich people do and do them. If you want to stop lying, then there's probably one or two people at least in the five people you spend most of your time with who you need to sever your connections with. Because there's probably one or two people there who are habitual liars. And so they have made it okay. They have, they, 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 they're justifying lying. And so you don't see what's wrong with it. This is so important on your path to Nirvana. Because on your path to Nirvana, you need constant influence. You always need a teacher. You know, how often can you come to a monastery, go into a, walk into a temple and spend time with a teacher who has also dedicated their lives to Nirvana? It's not every day you can do that. It's not every day you can listen to the sermons, not all day long, right? Most of the time you spend in your homes or in your lay lives, you spend with someone else and so it's important that you spend the time with people that you're proud to be spending time with. This is so important. So think about your workplace. Think about the guy you sit next to at the workplace. Think about the guy who you spend and who you're going to work and have your coffee with. Is it time to change? Is it time to find a new one? a new person to have your coffee with? Think about who you go and have your lunch with every afternoon. Maybe at work or maybe at school. Who do you have your lunch with? Who do you sit next to? Who do you go and play with at school? Who do you hang around with? Who do you go out and play a game of cricket? Who do you go to the pub with? In the last three months, whose home did you go for a party? Last six months, who did you go to a party with? Who did you hang around with? Is it time to change? Is it time to out with the old and in with the new? You can change. If you are serious about your salvation, then you had better do what I'm asking you to do. Because otherwise, I can only talk to you once a week. If you come on a Wednesday and a Saturday, maybe twice or three times a week. But the people that you spend most of your time with, they're talking to you 24-7. Except for the hours that you, you spend at, in bed, they're talking to you. Constantly feeding you with in new information. Constantly shaping your perspective on the world. And I would imagine constantly reminding you that this world is pleasurable. That it's joyful. That it's essenceful. And hey, what a, one, what a fun way to be around. What a fun place to be around. Let's all be here. Let's all hang around. Let's all live happily ever after. Now you might say, hang on Swami, I don't live with anyone. I live by myself. Okay. That's what you have TV for. 
That's what you have the internet for. That's what you have the magazines, the newspapers, media, your phone. So you don't have to physically be with someone. Anytime you see something, anytime you hear something, guess what? You're being influenced. Now you came into this room. Did you not see this decoration in this room? The hanging flowers, these lamps. Does this not influence you at least one tiny bit? If you've got a wedding coming up, you think, hmm, that's not a bad idea. See, you're being influenced. Anything you see, anything you hear is influencing you, folks. If you see someone with colored hair, does that not influence you? Why is it young guys, they start wearing gel on their hair? Where did that come from? You saw someone doing it. And then he thought, hmm, actually, that's smart. That's neat. I'm going to start applying gel on my hair. What about all these cuts that you have? You know, these fashionable haircuts that people pick up from time to time? All these trends. You have the Sangakkara cuts. Hmm? Mali cuts, the Bob Mali. And some people braid their hair. How do people pick this up from? Either you see or you hear. Why do you have a pond at home? Who said that was a good idea? No, you saw it in someone else's place. You went somewhere, you saw someone else had a pond at home. Hmm, that's, a, that's not a bad idea actually. Lovely fish swimming around. It's very soothing, very relaxing. We need to get a pond at home. You're being influenced. I don't need to say a lot to influence you. The next day you come in, if, what if I have a Coca-Cola banner on the wall? I've influenced you. You're constantly being influenced. The moment you open your eyes, you're being influenced. The moment you allow sounds to reach your eardrums, you're being influenced. But unlike dogs, unlike animals, unlike cows and sheep and cattle who can't be influenced because they're set in their nature, they're set in their way, they just go through vipaka, their instincts is what guides them. Unlike them, you and I, we can be influenced. This is why it's important to stop and take stock all the time of the people you spend your time with. Because if you hang around the wrong crowd, if you hang around people who show you the wrong kind of thing, if you hang around people who make you listen to the wrong kind of stuff, then lose, you lose your bearings. I used to live a very mediocre life. Before I came across a mentor who taught me to look at life in a very different way. This is, I'm not talking about the Dhamma. I'm talking about reaching my potential. In a lay life, in a worldly existence, I came across a mentor one day who sat me down. He asked me only one, he only asked me one question. He said, show me your list of goals. I said, my list of what? He said, your list of goals. I said, I don't have one. And then he said, well, if you don't have a list of goals, I can guess your bank balance, give or take a hundred pounds. I can guess your bank balance. And he was right. He said, I can guess your cholesterol levels. He was right. He, he said, I can guess how much in debt, indebted you are. And he was right. He said, I can guess how many books you read every year every six months, every three months, every month, and he was right. He was right. 
I didn't have a list of goals written down and he was right in all the guesses that he made. Because what he showed me was, you don't have purpose. You don't have purpose in your life. You just live life. You just let life go by. He showed me that for me, living was simply the passage of time. Just let time pass by. Until the last talk, the last take, and that's me done. And, if, and that, that experience changed my life around. Even in a worldly existence, that, that experience changed my life around. Because I had a lot of excuses. You know, when you ask me, where are your goals? I said, well, how can you, make, how can you expect to someone to make goals, you know, when the, the economy is changing so rapidly? Right? The state of the finance of the country, that's changing so rapidly. The politicians, the politics, you know, that's all changing all the time. How can you expect me to have goals? You can't, you know, he asked me, what is your, how much do you save every month? And I asked him, how can you expect me to save? The taxes are so high. Right? They charge you too much in taxes. There's a lot more month left at the end of the money. Right? How can you expect me to save any money? So I had this long list of excuses. So he, he, he listened to me as I went through my excuses, one by one and one by one. He said, Give me. So I gave him my list of excuses. He looked at it and said, this is one problem with this. So on that list I had the economy, the education system, politicians, the weather. Right? I had all this list of excuses. He said, this is one problem with this. What's that? You ain't on it. He said, you ain't on it. That's the problem with your list of excuses. What's that? You're not on it. So he said, tear this up, get a new bit of paper. Now here's your only list of excuses. And he's, he said, write down in block capital letters, M, E. That's your excuse. That changed my life around. He showed me that the problem was always me. He made me realize that. Because you know what, in life, things happen to everybody. To pretty much everyone. The winters come to everyone. Rains, everyone. Good times and bad times. They're not something that's reserved for the poor people. Rich people have poor times, bad times. So it's not the event that decides the outcome in your lives. It's how you respond to it. And the people you hang around with will influence you as to how you respond to the events that happen in your life. So if you remember last week, when we, you came to the sermon last week, I asked you to do something. I said I have strategically placed things in, your, in and around your homes. I put a chocolate cake in your fridge. I set the alarm clock for half four in the morning. Did that ring? Did the alarm clock go off? It was 4.30 in the morning I said it for. What time did it go off? The wretched alarm clock. Hmm? So I place these things strategically around your home. Because I wanted to give you food for thought. I wanted you all to take a moment to think how am I going to respond to this. Because alarms go off for everyone, every day. It's not just something that you have at home, so I also have an alarm. Just like you, madam, I also have an alarm that wakes me up in the morning. So the event is there for all of us. That's not different. But how I respond to the alarm has changed. It used to be I used to curse my alarm. The poor thing. I used to curse it. And sometimes when I had very little sleep, as the alarm is going after, if you ring one, one more time. But I changed my response because I got to influence, I got to be influenced by a good people, a good crowd, a good crowd of people.
the way I respond to events have changed now. I have learned that the problem is now with me. Always. Some of the time? Some of the time? No, always. It's always with me. How are you dealing with anger? Do you still have anger issues? Hmm? Do you? Anger? No? Are you ashamed? Don't be ashamed. You should see yourself when you're angry. You look very important. You go into that, let me show you who's boss mode, right? You look like a boss when you're angry. Like, don't mess with me, because I'm angry. Do you remember the last time you got angry? Or at least irritated? Annoyed by something? Frustrated? No? Do you remember? You have blank places like anger is a brand new... Is it, have you never heard of your anger? <laughs> Do you not know this emotion? Anger? I don't know why I bother preaching to you guys. You don't need this stuff. You're all saints. You don't get angry. You don't have desires. So if you got, the last time you got angry, I'm asking you now, just think about the last time you got angry, okay? Remind yourself the last time you got angry, or irritated, annoyed, right? Just when you go, remember that, yeah? Is that not anger? Of course it is. Irritation, annoyance, right? Ask yourself, which way did you point your finger? Did you point your finger outwards or did you point your finger back at you? This is a very important question. The answer to this question determines are you on the right track? It's very binary, is it not? It's either one or a zero. I'm asking you, did you point your finger outwards or did you point your finger towards you? The last time you got angry might have been this morning might have been when the bus arrived, or you were, you were late, or the bus was late. Oh, now, or oh, when I was expecting you at 2 o'clock, and you got here by 2 o'clock, I know, but it was late here for the arrangements to be made. There was a meeting here before that, so that dragged on for a bit longer than we expected. So did you turn up here expecting so Amin has it to be ready by two o'clock and you went <laughs> And which way did you point your finger? Yeah, anger is a very regular emotion. You know, we've all experienced anger. I don't see a problem with anger. What I see a problem with is when you are angry, which way do you point your finger? That's where I see the problem. If you're pointing your finger outwards, you're on the wrong track still. See, simple, really simple way to, re to figure out if you're on the right track to Nibbana. I'm not asking you which jhana you're in. I didn't ask you that question. I didn't ask you, are you a Sotapan or a Sakrudagami or a Nanagami? All I'm asking is a very simple, very basic question. Anyone can answer this. Anyone with a little bit of common sense can answer this question. If you understand my question, you can answer it. That's all it takes. A six-year-old can answer this question. Last time you got angry, which way did you point your finger? Did you point that way or did you point that way? Hmm.
So if you pointed your finger outwards, that way, when are you going to stop doing that? You know, you know that that has to stop. You can't be someone who's serious about nirvana if you still point your finger that way. I need you all to get to this understanding, this comprehension, to a state of mind where I, you know, I'm not, I'm not, say, I'm not faulting anger. It's okay, be angry if you want. It's fine. What I'm saying is, let's begin with whenever you are angry, stop pointing the finger outwards. You've got to seriously stop doing that. And until you stop doing that, you're not serious about your salvation. Nirvana is a joke to you. You're kidding when you say, I want to attain Nibbana, if you're still pointing your finger that way. You're kidding. The other opposite is the same. Last time, someone made you happy. Does someone ever make you happy? Is happiness someone, can someone else make you happy? No. If I, if I tell you now, think about the last time you were happy. Think about the last time you had a laugh. You were, you were jovial about something. You had fun. If again you pointed your finger outwards and said, that made me happy, he made me happy, she made me happy, still, you're kidding about Nirvana. Nirvana is still a joke. You're still wrong viewed. You still haven't entered Samaditi. Both anger and joy, you need to begin to realize, are manifestations of your own mental states. They are not outwardly things that come towards you. No one can make you angry, folks. No one can make you happy. Both anger and happiness are of your own making. You are the architect of your own anger. You are the architect of your own happiness. There's not a soul in this world that can make you happy. There's not a soul in this world that can make you angry. They're both your own making. So you need to stop pointing your finger outwards. If when I say you've got to stop your pointing your finger outwards, your response in your mind is, but Swami Nasa, how come? How come? That guy did something I didn't like. I told him not to do it and he did it. So surely he made me angry. You haven't realized Nibbana yet. You're not on the Noble Eightfold Path yet, because you still haven't seen the truth. You're still expecting outwardly, outwardly, occurrences, things out there to make you happy. And you're, you're thinking, you're of the understanding that they make you sad, they steal your happiness. So how can you attain Nirvana that way? How does one become angry? First, you've got to set an expectation. Right? That's where it all starts. Buddha, make your bed. Isn't that an expectation? I want my son, I want my child to make his or her bed when, when he or she wakes up. First thing you wake up, make your bed. That is that expectation. So now the expectation has been set. You walk into the bedroom and the bed has not been made. Now, you feel? You feel? Angry. So, knee-jerk reaction is, who made you angry? Child made you angry. Why? They didn't make the bed. Honey, we got the child's concert tonight, so make sure you come home by five o'clock. We've got to drive there and there's going to be a lot of traffic, they said so on the radio. We need to get by by half six. So make sure you get home by five o'clock, says the wife to the husband on the phone. Please make sure you get home by five o'clock because we have to get to the concert. 
So expectation has now been set. It's five o'clock. There's no husband. It's five past five. Now, annoyed. It's ten past five. Now, really annoyed. Quarter past five. Now, mad. Half past five. Oh! Anger. So who made you angry? <laughs> he made me angry, eh? Why? Husband's late. I asked him to be home by five o'clock and he's not. How dare he? How dare he? Anger. Is this how you feel at home still? I, I'm asking you, you know, these are practical examples from your life. You have an appointment. Doctor's appointment. Book for six o'clock. You turn up. The doctor's not there yet. Isn't that how it usually works? You turn up for the appointment and the doctors, ne the doctors are never there. <laughs> Uh, they must be busy people, right? So we, we can excuse them. But that makes you upset, makes you angry. And that's when you say, why can't these fools work on time? Why are they always late? Why are the buses always late? Why are the trains always late? Why are the flights always late? Why can't they work on time? Why can't they work to a timetable? Why can't they work to a schedule? Why are they always late? So again, pointing the finger outwards. When will you be happy? If you're always pointing your finger outwards, folks. Remember the, what I told I think we spoke about this some weeks ago. If you're pointing one finger outwards, you've got three fingers pointing at you. Why three? Raga, Desha, Mohan. Three fingers pointing right back at you. This is why you're angry. You've got to stop and realize that the problem's with you. You're driving along the road, you cross a white line. The police sees you, traffic police, waves at you, stop. You pull up. How do you feel right now? Oh, what fantastic policemen, they're doing their job perfectly. How good they are. That's how you feel, right? Isn't that when you start transferring merits to their parents? <laughs> May these policemen and their mothers and their fathers <laughs> oh, So you know, you have this feeling. You, you have the experience, right? Good. You feel angry. You feel angry and you point your finger which way? At them. And it doesn't have to be people. That was the last time you tried to pull your seat belt and it's stuck and it won't come. You keep tugging at it like a fool because of course you, know, you keep tugging at it at such force it's never going to come. You've got to be gentle with it. That's how a seat belt works. But how does that make you feel? You keep tugging at the seat belt. Oh, this bloody thing. Especially when it's late. You know, we Sri Lankans, we always work, to work on time, right? That's why we don't bother with seat belts. Because they take up a lot of time. You know, in the UK, cars, they depreciate in value. You buy a car today, you sell it in a year's time, it's depreciated in value. But in Sri Lanka, it's the other way, right? They appreciate in value. I realize why. Because there's one component in the car that never gets used. And it's that component that appreciates the value of the car. What's that? Seat belt.
Oh, and the rear view mirror. I'm just jesting. But the point here is, we've got to stop pointing our finger outwards, folks. Yeah, you know, let's just say I'm not I'm not I'm not against you feeling anger. I'm not trying to fix the problem, I'm trying to fix the cause. There's no point trying to say don't be angry. It doesn't work like that. Because anger is the result of not seeing the cause. We are not about treating the problem. We are about treating the cause. Let's treat the root of the problem. So I have nothing against you feeling anger. Be yeah, or ang as, as angry as you like. All I'm asking you to do is start looking at the right cause. Start identifying the cause of your annoyance, of your frustration. You put something on the cooker. And you think, right, I'm, I'm quickly going to go and put the laundry in the washing machine and I'll be back in two minutes. So it's simmering away nicely, right? The cooker, it's all working, it's going to, going to plan. So you go quickly to the washing machine, put your laundry in there, you press the start button and the, the washing machine won't turn on. You keep pressing the button. If once it doesn't work, how many times if you press is it going to start working? Hmm? So why do people then keep... Why do, why do people do that? It's like the TV remote. You press the on button once and the TV doesn't come on. What do they do next? They almost stand on it. Such is the frustration and the irritation that people feel. So you keep pressing that button, right? Two minutes, that's on the cooker now, right? So you keep pressing the button and then you look at the washing machine. Oh, someone's pulled the plug out. Because you've got this extension socket that the little one took away because he had to plug his PS4 and now he's forgotten to put it back in. So you go, ah, oh, and you plug it back in. But you've been pressing that button for two minutes. Now you plug the back in, plug it back in, the washing machine is working. So quickly you run back to the kitchen. And what's happened? It's burnt. So now it's decision time. What is the decision you have to make? Which way do I point my finger? This is decision time. You can either go that way or you can go this way. You got the fingerometer. It's going like this. It's going to stop somewhere. The fingerometer. It's either going to go that way or so it's going to go this way. I'm asking you, last time this happened to you, which way did it stop? Where did it stop? Did it go stop like that or did it stop like this? Last time you were buttoning your shirt up. Now it's late for work. You start buttoning your shirt and the button comes off. There's a, there's a sound effect for that. Do you not know that? There's a sound effect for these things. You tie your shoelaces and the shoelace breaks. What's the sound effect? No, it's great we have a sound effect for these things. You're watching the TV and you're watching the cricket. Right? There's a, there's a ball in the air and there's a fielder right beneath it and the power goes off. What's the sound effect? Now again, it's time to transfer merits to the Ceylon Electricity Board. And all of these examples from your life. See, it's decision time. Which way do you point your finger? This way or this way? Makes all the difference. You know, that, that, that time, few seconds you have to make that choice. 
makes all the difference because in that whatever decision you make in those few seconds will determine the outcome of this event because it's in those two one or two seconds you have to decide the response that you come up with if you fail to see that all that's happened here is the unfulfillment of an expectation and the expectation is the problem then you're going to point your finger that way you made me angry she made me angry he made me angry it made me angry that made me angry the cat made me angry i'm asking you when will you ever find peace because every man and his dog out there they 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 all make you angry so how many people do you have to go and fix now how many people do you have to fix countless have you begun to see the problem with this wanting and desire is the problem setting expectations is the problem you expect x you get y problem what is the problem is it y or expecting x expecting x so why did we expect x because we believed that x is what brings us happiness this is what's going to make me happy you're running low on fuel you walk out you drive up to the next fuel station and they've got a board put up on the filling tanks out of fuel try the next one in 2 kilometers and then it says on the radio there's a strike now how do you feel you feel angry every time you hear someone's on strike how does that make you feel the doctors are on strike hmm? the postmen are on strike the laborers are on strike makes you feel angry right so for you to not feel angry you got to go find out all the problems that all of these people have and fix them so they don't go on strike again how many associations are out there how many working groups are out there how many organizations are out there how many departments and institutions are out there for you to go and fix all their problems so that they don't go on strike again when are you ever going to find happiness when can, when can you ever be in peace so this is what you know this sounds so simple right because it is don't look for complicated answers because really the problem isn't that complicated it's a really simple problem and the solution is equally simple the only problem here is that we set expectations and then we wait for our expectations to be fulfilled when they are not fulfilled we say we have a problem no the problem started long while ago when was that when you set the expectation that's when the problem started that's when you planted the seed of your suffering the moment you decided i want this i need this i desire this that's when the problem started because you have become a slave then how does one when you when you walk up to the to uh, to the king or perhaps in a court how do you speak to the uh the uh either to the king or how do you address the the judge yo yo either honestly or you can say your sire sire which is a mark of respect you know you 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 show your subservience right sire so when you address someone as sire you're showing that you are subservient to them you are their subordinate they are senior right you you're junior in authority in power whatever sire so isn't that the case with desire 
The moment you have a desire, are you now not a slave? To whatever it is you desire, you are a slave. The very thing that you desire, you are a slave to. Because what you are saying is, you are desire. <clears throat> I desire this. I desire that. I desire the other. In other words, you are subservient to those things that you desire. That's why you call them sire. Desire. That is the problem. Wanting is the problem. Desire is the problem. If you have begun to see this, if you have begun to realize this, you are beginning to understand the first noble truth of suffering. People don't realize that there is suffering. People out there who have not understood the Dhamma, who, has not, who have not come across the Dhamma, will never accept, will never acknowledge that desire is the problem. They'll always say, not having what you want is the problem. Are you seeing the difference here? I want X, I don't have X. Depending on who you ask, what the problem is, you get a different answer. If you speak to someone who has understood the noble truth of suffering, they'll say, the first sentence you said, and that was, I want X, that's the problem. If you speak to someone who is ignoble, who has not realized the noble truth of suffering, they'll say, not having X, that's the problem. So, really simple terms, let's put, let's put that into an example. Right? Young man, he wants to find a partner, and he goes looking for one. So now he wants, a, he wants a partner, he wants to get married. So then he goes looking for someone. He goes and asks a girl out, hey, I like you, what do you say? She says, no, I'm not interested. And now he's upset because he sees that that is the problem. His problem is, I want her and she said, no. She said, no. I want her. She said, no. If you ask him, what's the problem? You know, he's, he's, having, a long, he's having a long face now. He's on a bench, holding his head in his hands. Friend comes up to him and says, hey, mate, what's wrong? You know what? I asked her. And she said, no. Oh, that's the problem. That is not the problem. That is not the real problem. See, I want you to now put this into your, into your life. Put this into your life experiences so that this becomes true to you. This becomes evident to you. Why are you having a long face? I asked her and she said, no. That's the problem. That's not the problem. The problem that he's speaking of, anyone can see that. In fact, it's not something you see, it's something you feel. This is feeling suffering. Suffering can either be realized or experienced. The suffering that he's talking about is the suffering to be experienced. In Buddhist philosophy, the Buddha's teaching is not about experiencing suffering. He teaches suffering to be realized, not to experience. Experiencing is something you do with emotion. The emotion of disappointment. People say that is a problem. Have you not come across negative emotions? No, we all speak of that, negative emotions. And people will teach you how to address this. Now, if you go to a counsellor, why does someone go to a counsellor? I'll give you two answers. Do you tell me which one? A. I asked her. I want, I want to go out with her. B. She said no. For which of these two reasons does one go looking for a counsellor? Is it I asked her or I want to go out with her or is it she said no? She said no. That's the wrong reason. That's not why you need to go to the counsellor.
That's the wrong reason. But if you look at counseling adverts on the papers, right, they say, we fix broken hearts. Hmm? We bring back lost ones, loved ones. We have 15 years of experience in the industry of bringing back loved ones. We have charms and spells that can bring back loved ones for you. Hmm? There's all this stuff. Some people call themselves cupids. They can bring back loved ones. Don't you worry. You want her? I will get her for you. This is magic potion. All we need is a flock of her hair. Bring it and I'll, I'll make this potion for you. Get her to drink it and then she'll be with you in no time. Don't people do these kind of things? Of course. Why? Because they haven't seen the problem. Why is this not the real problem that we need to see? Why is this not the problem we need to be talking about? Because it doesn't fix the root of the problem. It's like pruning the branches of a tree. Every time you prune, it's going to just going to keep growing back. You can't stop weed from growing just by plucking at its twigs or pulling out a couple of leaves. You can't do it that way. You've got to uproot it. You've got to pull it out of the roots, out of the ground, with, along with the roots, so it doesn't grow again. The problems that people solve are the wrong problems because they're, all they're doing is they're pruning it, not addressing the root problem. Wanting is the problem. See, that guy who wanted that girl to go out with him, he should have gone to the temple. He should have gone and spoken to a monk because the counselor is the wrong person to go to because the counselor does not fix those kind of problems. You can't go to a counselor and say, I want to go out with a girl. Help. They'll, because the next question they're going to ask is, okay, who do you want to go out with? That's what they're going to ask you. What do you have the matrimonials for? To help you make your mind up not to get married? No, to bring you the person that you want to get married to. Again, fixing the wrong problem. That's fixing the wrong problem. Well, you got married, right? Why? You fixed the wrong problem. You had a problem, but you fixed the wrong one. All he did was plaster over the problem. There's a moldy wall. A wall which is moldy. Right? Because the water is being seeping through it. Over a year or so it's become moldy. So, there's a quick fix. Whitewash. Just paint over it. And it looks as if the problem's gone. But has it really gone? No. Sure and sure, it's coming back. How many layers of pain can stop a moldy wall from showing up again? None. Because no matter how many times you paint over it, given enough time, it's going to show up again. The way we approach our life's problems, folks, have to change. Who here doesn't have problems in life? Put your hand up, I don't have any problems. Nice, so you all have problems. Nice, so you're in the right place then. You're in the right place because what I'm trying to help you is figure out the right problem. All of your problems have one root. But above the root, they manifest themselves in a hundred thousand different ways. If you spend all your life trying to address all of these hundred thousand different problems, well, you're wasting your life away. Because by the time you've fixed the first 500 and gone on to work on the next 500, the first 500 you fixed, they're going to start to resurface. It's like herding cattle without shutting the gates. Keep the gates open, herding the cattle, right? And by the time you've gone back to get the next bunch, these guys have escaped. 
or herding sheep if you like. The day you can make your mind up, let them roam free. I don't need to cage these guys anymore. Now you have fixed the problem. This is what I want you to. Re- I, this is what I want you to realize because I know you know you didn't come here for a party. I know you didn't come here to the. You didn't come to the temple because we offer you a free lunch. Hmm? No, we don't give you a free lunch here. We don't give you free drinks, or we don't give you clothing, or we don't give you any of that kind of stuff. You're you're all here because you have problems in your life. Yes or no? Yes, you're all here because you have problems in your life. Why did I ordain? Because I have problems. We have issues. We all have issues. So I know then you are all here because you have problems in your lives. Then it is my duty to help you find solutions to your problems. Isn't that why you invited me to come and talk to you? That's why you asked me to give you a sermon. To help you fix your life's problems. What I'm telling you is, there's really only one problem that needs to be fixed. If you realize that, folks, all of this hard work and labor and toiling that you do to fix a hundred thousand problems can stop. Because really, there's only one root problem. Fix that one problem and all the other problems will disappear. We need to pull this weed out along with its roots. We've got to uproot it and then all the life's problems will be gone. And that problem is desire, wanting, needing, longing and yearning. So this is why I started by saying, asking you to think back about the times you got angry. Because anger is a problem. And I asked you who here does not get angry and you, none of you raised your hands up. So one of the problems you have in your life is anger. And you want to fix that problem. Good. Let's fix it. To fix the problem of anger, I want you to start looking at the times in your life when you have been angry. And rather than pointing your finger outwards, look within to find the answer. Look on the inside. Look inside, look internally and you will find the answer. Setting expectation was the problem. You set an expectation on something that you wanted. Expectation, in fact, was the wanting. I want this to happen. It didn't happen, so now I'm angry. I want that to happen. It didn't happen, and so therefore, now I'm angry. Angry. I wanted that promotion. The other guy got it. So now, angry. Angry with whom? The other guy. You brought home some fruit. Some of it's gone bad. How does that make you feel? Angry. Why? Or who with? The shopkeeper. You realize that you've been shortchanged. Angry. With whom? The other guy, the shopkeeper. As you're driving, someone pulls up in front of you. Now, angry. Who with? The guy who pulled up in front of you. Okay, let's say we sort him out. Right, we pull up, give the guy a bashing. Right, do you, don't ever pull up in front of anyone ever again. Right, so we put him in hospital. Right, so now we continue our journey. What's going to happen a kilometer down the road? Another guy is going to pull up in front of you. So what are you going to do now? Well, there aren't enough beds in all the hospitals. To put all those people in the wards, to keep them out of the roads, there aren't enough beds in hospitals, so how are you going to fix the problem now? Oh yeah, let's make another hospital. Is that the, pro- is that the answer? That's not the answer. So then why does when someone pull up in front of you, your middle finger goes up? Hmm? That's become the new trend now. I hear even in Sri Lanka now it's the new trend. Middle finger. Apparently. I've never seen anyone do it to me, certainly not as a monk, but as a lay person, got plenty of that. (laughs) 
People are so angry. So who are they pointing this middle finger at? The other guy. I'm so angry at you. I'm cursing you. You know, sometimes I, I've seen on some occasions, right? People get so infuriated. They want. They don't want to just show the middle finger. They want to roll down their windows and actually shout at the other person. But in their fury, they don't even have the patience to roll down their window. They keep turning the the roller, but the window is not coming down fast enough. Such fury, burning on the inside. Do you not see the irony in this? Let's say someone actually did pull in front of you, okay? And it's wrong to do that. So who's at fault here? The guy who pulled up in front of you. So he's the guy who is, you know, by tra- he's made a traffic violation. Let's say it's a traffic violation to pull up in front of someone. So who's wronged here? The guy who pulled up in front of you. Who's suffering? Hmm? You. <laughs> do you not see the irony? Someone else made the mistake and I'm suffering. That's not right. If he made the mistake, then he should be suffering. So why am I angry? Do you remember the last time this happened to you? Someone pulled up in front of you? You started gritting your teeth? And your whole face went red. You started swearing. Oh, and then the, you start put, pressing the, the horn and until the guy goes deaf. But do you not realize that when you, when you press the horn, who gets to hear the higher number of decibels? <laughs> it's louder to the guy in the car. Because the guy in the, front, in, the, in the car in front of you, he's got his windows rolled out. He ain't, he's not going to hear it half the time. So why are you punishing yourself? I mean, you might as well slap yourself in the face. Guy pulls up in front of you. Slap yourself in the face. Why do you torture yourself like this? This is self-torture. No, the Buddha said that's not the path to liberation. He said, give up self-mortification. It's not the path to liberation. Atta kilamatan yoga. He said, don't do that. So why do you still try it? Self-mortification. He said, dwe me bhikkave anta pabba jitena nasa vitabba. Ye chayam kamesu kamasu kalikanu yoga. Atta kilamatan yoga. These two extremes, monks, I say, a monk who has gone forth must avoid extreme indulgence in sensuality and self-mortification. So some guy pulls up in front of you, what do you do? Self-mortification. Exactly what the Buddha said, don't do. Why? You're pointing the finger outwards. I talk to other people. Mm-hmm. That time I was with the student, from that point I am satisfied. So how do you manage that? So you mean expecta- expectation? Yes. So I know that it's another expectation. Yeah. But for coming to my sermon on time, so because of that day I won't be able to come. Hmm. So then I have to do a piece. Hmm. How do you manage that? Good question. So you all, you'll all have this experience. You know, to be somewhere on time, right? The appointment has been fixed. 
You have to be there. So a guy pulls up in front. He's, he's driving like a tortoise. Right? The road ahead is clear. Right? He, could, he could be driving at 30 miles per hour and he's going at 10. Also, oh, you have this experience. Yes, you have to be at the appointment on time. There's no doubt about that. Perhaps if you're, if you're late, you might miss the opportunity. So you can look at this from a number of different angles. One, you want to be there on time because otherwise you're going to miss either the appointment. Okay? So you want to be there, right? That is also an expectation. I need to be there. I have to be there. Let's say it's a concert or a musical or you have to be at a, it's a film or, the, or perhaps a sermon. You still want to listen to the sermon, don't you? You desire listening to the sermon. That's the problem. That's not to say try and arrange yourself and organize yourself to be here on time. But if things happen, see, think about this, right? And I, I'm glad that the gentleman used the example of the sermon. Why do you come to the sermons? To figure out how you can not feel angry in the first place. We're not talking about, we don't talk about dealing with anger. Right? The, the psychologists and psychiatrists, they will talk about that, dealing with anger. We don't deal with anger. We teach you how not to be angry in the first place. That's what Buddhist philosophy is for, how to not be angry in the first place. So what is the point of being angry? To get somewhere where they teach you how not to be angry. You get my point? You're going to be somewhere. You're going to, you want to get there to learn how not to be angry. Someone delays, some or someone or something delays you and now you're angry. Why? I need to get there so that I can not be angry. Of course, it may be that you're late. So for that, you know, from a practical approach, you can expect traffic, maybe leave a bit earlier. I don't need to teach these things really, you know, you know all of this stuff. You can leave earlier, right? Leave, uh, allow time for traffic, allow time for breakdowns, allow, allow time for unexpected things. But actually I know what you're asking me is, how do you manage your, your, your mentality at that point of time? Not about the actual logistics of it. How do you address that? the mental frustration at that time, the annoyance that you experience. Well, you need to stop for a moment and ask yourself, which way does the finger or meter need to turn now? See, think about it this way. Let's say as you're driving along the road, or you need to be at the sermon by 3 o'clock or 2 o'clock. So you're, you're driving up and you hear the trains approaching. So now the barriers start coming down. You want to get through the gates before the gates come up in front of you. But despite your best efforts, you are unable to do so. However, as the gates are coming down, the guy in front of you, so he stalls and then he starts his car again and because he stalls, that's what made you angry. You know, why can't this idiot drive? Why do they give license to people like this? Right? All these questions that start coming in your mind. Right? So, because now you're angry with this guy and the, and, and the car and the, the driving school and, the, and the, 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 the motor department, right? And everyone, the, the guy who serviced the car, everyone, right? And, his, and their families and their ancestors and everyone starts getting cursed. Okay? The whole country is now cursed. Even I can start feeling it. <laughs> Somehow, you know, why, do the, why don't these monks teach these people how to drive? <laughs> and you'll go even as far as that. And then the politicians and even the president gets to hear about it, right? So, anyway, you're, you're swearing at this guy, so he stalled a moment before the gates came down. Had he not stalled, you would have been able to cross the, the railway line, okay? So, this guy, because he stalled, he starts his car again, and as a result, he moves onto the tracks. But there was something on the tracks that stopped the car. Now the car can't move any further. 
and the train's approaching. So there was something tangled on the tracks, something got tangled in, in the wheels of the car and now the car can't move. Now aren't you glad that this guy stole it in front of you? Because now the train's approaching and this guy has no other alternative other than getting out of the car and running for his life. The train comes and the car is a disaster. It's a disaster. It's an accident. The car's destroyed. Just imagine the situation, right? So now what do you say? Thank God he broke down in front of me. A moment before you were saying, why did he break down in front of me? If only he had learned to drive, you know, all those things that you were saying out loud, swear words and all those things, you were cursing the bugger. Why did he break down in front of me? But now you are glad that he did. Because had he gone through, perhaps you might have been the next one to have gotten caught. On the, on the tracks. So now you're glad that it happened. You see, after the event, you have changed your perspective. The reason for that is you value your life more than being on time for the appointment. So now you say, oh, I'm glad. I don't mind being late for the appointment because I'm, I'm saved. My life has been saved. The alternative would have been my life would have been destroyed. So you see, the outcome was the same. The car stopped in front of you. A moment ago, you were angry about it. Now, you're glad that it happened. The only reason is, it's a different expectation. First, I, I didn't want to be late for the appointment. You didn't, you, didn't, you didn't worry about, in fact, you didn't even fear your life at that point in time because that was not a concern. Whether I'm going to get through the rail tracks alive was not a concern because you didn't for a moment doubt that. But the moment you saw the, ra the rail crash, now you begin to think, whoa, what if it had been me? What if it would have been, it had been me? Now you're glad that it happened. So I suggest to you then, if ever you find yourself in a situation where you're held up in traffic or light goes red, I, you have that experience, right? You see it's green, and then what do you do? Foot goes on the pedal to cross the, li the light, to cross the line before it goes red. Then you break all speed limits, right? And then it goes amber, and it goes red. Like, you know, like they're, they're waiting for you to come up to the light, and then they, they go red. That's how the traffic lights are programmed. They wait until you come up to the line, and then it goes red. You know, it, it feels like that sometimes. Be glad that that's how it worked out. That's how it happened. Instead of seeing that as a problem, one, see that as an opportunity to address the issue that lay within. You see, because if, if the traffic light didn't go red, you may not have been able to identify the vexation that was within your mind. Because it went red, now you know you sensed anger. You sensed that frustration. You sensed that annoyance. Thanks to the red light, you now understand, you now know that I still suffer inside. Use that as, an, as a learning opportunity. And secondly, because it went red, perhaps you avoided a collision. Because it went red. So really, if you think about it in that sense, Everything that works out right now, uh, whatever turns out right now, is the reason that you are alive right now. Whatever the circumstances that turn out right now is the very reason that you are alive right now. So be grateful. Be grateful that the light went red. Be grateful that the, the train was approaching and the gates shut. Be grateful that a guy pulled up in front of you. Because it might have been that had he not pulled up in front of you, you would have sped up and maybe a, a container would have collapsed on the car. Maybe that could happen. So the fact that it didn't happen was because this guy pulled up in front of you. So rather than looking at the dark cloud, try and spot the silver lining. Try and spot the silver lining. But that is a very short term fix. It's not, it's, not, it's not the fix that will help you to go towards nirvana. Because 
Seeing the glass as half full when it's half empty is not the path to Nibbana. The path to Nibbana is not wanting. Giving up your desire for the glass to be half full. Then it doesn't matter whether it's half full or half empty. So the fact that you want to be here on time for the, for the sermon, you want to be here on time for the, warm, for the sermon or the, the appointment, you know the word want that's the problem. I want to be here on time. I want to be here Tuesday. I want to catch the train. I want to be on the flight. I want to talk to her before she goes. I want to give her a call before the office closes. All these wantings, this is the problem. Want. Want is the problem. So, of course, you could ask me, well, Swami so if the dentist shuts at 5 o'clock and I, I, I have to be there by 5 o'clock, otherwise, you know, I'm going to get a toothache and then what's going to happen? Yes, true, I agree. I admit, you've got to be there by 5 o'clock because if, if the dentist shuts for the day, then you're going to have to wait till the following day. Use this as an opportunity to ask yourself, why is it that I have to visit the dentist today? Why do I have to visit the dentist today? Because I've got a bad tooth. Why do I have a bad tooth? Oh, yes. Because I have a tooth. Why do I have a tooth? Because I've got, I need my teeth to chew food, to eat, to talk. So why do I need to do that? Well, because I need to sustain myself. I need food to sustain my body. Why that? Well, because I need to maintain my organs, eyes, ears, nose, tongue. Why that? Because I want to be able to see, to smell, to taste, to feel. Why? Because of my attachments. I want to see. That's why you, need, you could miss your dentist appointment. I want to hear. I want to smell. I want to taste. I want to experience. No matter which way you look at it, the root cause of all problems is wanting. Wanting. Give me any problem in your life and I'll show you how it's linked to wanting something. Doesn't matter what the problem is. No matter what problem you have, I can link it back to wanting. Okay, one guy says, I've got lung cancer. Show me how that's linked back to wanting. Of course it's linked back to wanting. Why do you get the lung cancer? Because you have lungs. Why do you have lungs? Well, so you can breathe. Why do you want to breathe? So you can live. Why do you want to live? So I can see and smell and taste and experience. Why do you want to do that? Well, because that's what makes me happy. So seeing and smelling and hearing and listening and, and tasting, these we expect to make us happy. But we know that none of these things actually bring happiness to us. So ignorance is the root of lung cancer. A guy says, I'm in debt. Show me how that's related to wanting. Well, duh. How did you get in debt? You borrowed. Why did you borrow? Because I needed money. Why did you need money? Because I wanted to, I don't know, get, get a, go to university or get a car or build another story on top of the two-story house that I have. Right? Go on holiday. You know people take out loans to go on holiday? Yeah, they do that. They take out loans to go on holiday. Well, who am I to judge? So, they, yeah, whatever. Right? I wanted this, therefore I didn't, I didn't have enough money, so I went and borrowed money. So, does it not all link back to wanting? Everything, every problem in your life, I want you to be able to link back every problem you have in your life to the root of all problems, and that is wanting. Couple gets married. Wife can't get pregnant. She goes for IVF. That's my problem. Can't have a child. How do we link back that to want? Well, I want a child. That's the problem. Why do you want a child? So I can cuddle it. So I can be happy because, you know, doesn't a child make you happy? What, what is it about a child that makes you happy? Seeing it. Hmm? Touching it, feeling it, smelling it, cuddling it, playing with it. Ultimately, again, you're talking about your five senses. 
right? So, when we have, whenever we talk about living, we are talking about pleasing the five senses. In other words, taking inputs from the outside world through our five senses, because our five senses are the doors. The doors that take in, that open up to the outside world to allow experiences from the outside world to come into, the, come into our mind. This is our five senses. We open these doors expecting guests. Who are our guests? Sight, sound, smell, taste and touch. These are our guests. So we expect these guests and that's why we open the doors to welcome these guests into our mind. We expect that they will bring us what? Gifts. Don't we? We expect the gifts, uh, we expect the guests will bring us gifts. What is the gift that we expect our guests to bring? This is what Ashwada is. Pleasure. We expect our guests to bring us gifts of pleasure. We expect sights to bring the gift of pleasure. We expect sounds and smells and taste and touch to bring the gift of pleasure. But do they really? No. In fact, they do bring something, it's just not a gift. It's in wrapping paper, yes, but you hold it next to your ear and it goes. What is that? Well, you find out in a minute. It's a ticking time bomb. That's what it is. So never did the guest of sight bring you a gift of pleasure. It always brought you a ticking time bomb. How so? Because what is sight after all? Something that is vexatious. If you attach yourself to it, it's going to blow up. If you attach yourself to it, you're going to suffer. So who here wants those guests to bring those gifts of ticking time bombs? Do you want that? No. See, when you realize the truth, folks, you will, you will, st you will, you will stop and ask the question, why do I even exist? What is the point? What is the point of being alive? You will begin to ask this question. Until you realize this, questions will be, where did life start? How did it start? Was it chicken or egg first? These are the problems people have. Until they realize, it's not who shot the arrow. The arrow has been shot and the poisoned head is leaking out poison and that's seeping through my blood. It's killing me. So the problem I have now is not who shot the arrow. How do I pull the damn thing out? You understand what I'm saying? Someone's shot you with a poisoned arrow. It's gone right through your heart. It's pierced through your heart. It's a poisoned head and the poison is seeping through your blood. What's the first question you have? Who shot it? Where did it come from? What's it made of? Hmm? What's the name of the archer? Is that, is that your problem? No, how do I get the damn thing out? Whereas a lot of people spend time asking the question, what is it made of? I will not let you pull it out until you tell me what it's made out of. I will not let you pull it out until you tell me who shot it. Which country is it made in? Is that the right or the wrong question to be asking? Wrong question. That's what the Buddha said. He, he, raised, he mentioned a number of questions. He said, don't ask those questions. Pointless. It's not worth asking those questions. So people went and asked him, Venerable Sir, what is the origin of life? Where did the universe start? Where did, when did the world come into being? He said, don't ask. Not because he didn't know. Because it's pointless asking that question. The person asking the question is a man who's been shot with a poisoned arrow. The question he should be asking is, how do I pull the damn thing out? Because it's killing me. So for as long as the poisoned arrow of anger has pierced through your heart, stop asking the question of who shot it. Stop asking that question, who shot it, who shot the arrow? That's not the question to be asking. 
how do I pull it out? You have been shot. Pull out the arrow. Stop pointing the finger outwards. Start pointing the finger towards you. Start at home. You ask your children to do their homework, they haven't done their homework. But as a responsible parent, of course you have to get them to do their homework. You can't just say, well, you know, I can't be bothered. That's also Anit Chai. You can't say that. It's your duty. Get them to do their homework. But don't be angry. Anger is your problem. Not having done their homework, that's their problem. Anger is your problem. Anger is your problem. Anger is always your problem. Are you willing to accept that? That anger is your problem? Are you? So are you promising me then that you will never again take out your anger on someone else? Can I get you to sign? We've got a, pay, we've got a, sheet, we've got a sheet. You're going to have to sign the dotted line. I hereby swear solemnly that henceforth I will never take out my anger on anyone else because I completely and categorically agree that anger is my own making. Are you willing to sign it? If ever you break the terms and conditions, there'll be punishment. Are you willing to sign it? There'll be punishment. You know what? I'm not going to punish you. How about you punish yourselves? Here's what I suggest you do. Get yourself a piggy bank. Okay? Get yourself a piggy bank. Every time you get angry or irritated or annoyed about something or someone and if you don't have the intellect, the intelligence and the wisdom to point the finger towards you. If at least for a moment you point the finger outwards and you start to say something. If you take action, as in you raise an arm, you hit someone, so this has gone way more than mental. It's, it's gone through mental, through verbal, through physical. Right? It's gone, the, it's gone the, the full mile. So as in you're actually hitting someone now. Or you're raising, you're raising a finger. This is what? Kaya karma. Bodily actions. You've gone as far as bodily action. It's not just Mano Sankara, not just Vachi Sankara. It's not simply a case of you saying something, but actually you've lifted a finger now. You say, You. I told you not to do that. Now it's gone to physical. Right? Here's what you should do. What are the what coins do they have now? I don't know because I don't use money anymore. Last time it was only ten rupees. Is it still ten? Okay. Three, three coins, 10 rupees, has to go into the till. Three of them. Why? It's gone from mental to verbal to physical. Three 10 rupee coins have to go into it. If you can stop at verbal, put up. Okay, so it's only verbal. You haven't lifted a finger. You haven't actually picked up a stick to hit the child or or anyone for that matter. It's only verbal. Two. So 20 rupees has to go into the till. And if you can stop it at mental. So mano sankar. So in, in your mind, you've gone angry. You've gotten angry at the other person. Not realizing that the problem is with you. You're thinking it's with the other person. One. 10 rupee coin goes into the till. So I'm not punishing you. You're punishing yourself. Keep filling up the till and when it's, when, it's full, when it's full up, you can use that money to give an offering or a dane, an alms to the Mahasangha. And as you make that offering, you make a resolve. May the merits that I acquire by making this offering to the Mahasangha, which includes the Buddha, may I be able to Extinguish the fire of anger and aversion, hatred from my mind once and for all. 
How about that? So you're punishing yourself? I don't know how to punish you. But after all, it's not really a punishment. You're penalizing yourself, but by doing that, you're actually earning merit also. So you see, I'm not telling you count to ten and wait for your anger to subside. Because we're not about fixing the problem, we're about fixing the cause. Because when you keep filling up that till, that, that piggy bank, you're going to have to, you know, of course, if you come here to, to make an, arm, an offering, we don't just accept your arms, we preach to you. We preach to you the Dhamma. So really, well, on that day you go to the, to the temple, it doesn't have to be this temple, any temple. Or perhaps you invite the Mahasanga to your home and give them arms. Ask the Swami Nuhanse, Swami Nuhanse, the reason I'm making this offering to you today is because over a period of, let's say, three months, or a month if you're really short-tempered, <laughs> over a period of one month, right, I have managed to fill this till up, and every time I got angry, I put 10 rupees into it, and that's the money I'm using to make this alms offering to you. Please would you preach to me, or preach to this gathering, the Dhamma, so that we can extinguish the fire of anger from our minds. Now isn't that an investment worth making? There you go. Because what, when the monk will preach, he will preach to you the Dhamma, which will treat the cause of the problem, not the effect. We will address the cause. So everyone at home, not only the adults, but also the children. Children, you can use your pocket money. So you better start, say, putting some pocket money aside to put into the anger, anger bank. Now if you get 10 rupees for lunch, you better start saving up. 8 rupees for, oh, you can't have anything for 10 rupees nowadays, can you? I still think about my school days. How much do you have to give pocket money for lunch nowadays? Hmm? How much? At least 100. Jeez. Time does fly by. Okay, at least 100. Right, well that's 10 lots of 10 rupees. So let's say at school you had a fight with someone. Hmm? You, had a, you had an argument with someone and you had a fight with someone. So now you can come and tell Ammi, Amma, I had a fight with someone at school. What happened? So she, you know, he took my ball and then I had to hit him. He didn't give it back to me. I asked for it, he didn't give it back to me, so I had to hit him. Okay, that's three, that's 30 rupees. 30 rupees in the till, please. So if it happened, then you're going to have to save up from lunch money 30 rupees to put into the till. So every day if this happens, then the 100 rupees that you got for lunch is going to go down to 70 rupees. This guy, this child is going to get malnourished pretty soon. And he's going to get so weak, he's not going to be able to hit anyone anyway. <laughs> soon enough. So, whichever way you look at it, it's a win-win situation. So anyway, when you make the offering to the Mahasangha, invite them, ask them, plead to them to give you a sermon on anger and how you can treat this disease of anger. But it all has to start with Making sure your finger fingerometer is pointing in the right direct direction. I need you to make this a habit, folks. And this is practical, practical stuff you can do. I'm not saying count to ten. I'm not gonna. I'm not. I'm not in that business of sugar coating the problem. I'm not in the business of sugar coating the problem. Let's let's go to the cause and fix the cause. Wanting is the root of anger. Desire is the root of anger. When you become a slave to something, that's when you desire it. Now you have put yourself in a position whereby you can be angry. That anger can come at a future moment. If you like this, for instance, if you're telling me now you like this, you desire this, well, it may be that you will become angry at a future point in time because of this. All I have to do is take this off of you. Take it away from you and now you're angry. Have you not seen little kids fighting with each other over toys, you know, little things? 
it's in it's in your nature to be angry you don't have to teach someone how to be angry it's in their nature to be angry others how do little babies fight with each other they hit each other when they never went to angry anger school how come how come they know how to fight with each other it's just in their nature because they came into this world wanting something so for as long as you want something there's always scope for anger you don't have to teach someone how to be angry if they want something they'll always be angry so how does someone become someone who no longer who never becomes angry you first have to become someone who desires nothing that is the only way to fix anger not counting to 10 not taking pills not thinking over it before you speak up right? these are all good okay they are practical but that is only sugar coating the problem that's just patching up the problem not fixing it it's plastering over the problem not fixing it you got to treat desire you got to treat wanting so why do people want things then why do people want things why do people desire things indeed because they expect the very things that they want the very things they desire to bring them pleasure there's no other reason you want anything what are some of the things you want hmm? i want to watch tv i want to eat good food i want to listen to music i want to look at paintings i want to watch the football i want to watch the cricket i want the jvp to win that's not my personal opinion by the way <laughs> i'm talking about a different kind of jvp not the political party what does jvp stand for janata vimukti peramuna what is vimukti hmm freedom janata is people freedom to the people who gave us freedom who gave us freedom the buddha indeed so people's freedom is it front or party uh, i'm what i'm talking about is the freedom that the buddha gave us the freedom that the buddha gave to people all people like you and i so the day you become a noble one the day you begin to see the buddha's dhamma what party are you a member of the jvp why now my purpose in life is seeking freedom freedom from what the pangs of desire aversion and delusion i wear matching colors don't i <laughs> red robes but you know i'm not talking about a political party because i have no affiliation to any political parties my only affiliation is to the buddha's party that's the only party i want to go and hang around in and that is the freedom party the party which gives us freedom that is all nirvana is folks right if someone asks you what is nibbana freedom freedom from what freedom from desire freedom from wanting freedom from needing freedom from yearning freedom from longing these are the problems that you suffer from this is why you are stuck in a 9 to 5 job because you want things because you need things because you desire things you have that loan to pay off why do you get the loan out in the first place because you wanted something that's why you have to do jobs now that's why you have moonlighting that's why you have to work extra weekends overtime right whenever you're vexing to relieve yourself of vexation what must you do vex someone else that's how it works Let me explain. Uh, an artist, 
Okay, let's say an artist. So he draws pictures, paintings. The guy is hungry. He needs to eat. Is that not a vexation? It's a vexation. So he needs money. So how does he make his money? By selling his paintings. To buy a work of mine, if I've made a painting, I want you to buy it, what must I do? I need to come up to you and appraise it with you. I need to talk to you about it. I'm saying, look at this painting, don't you like it? It's beautiful colors. Do you not like the scenery? So I start to get you to vex. If I can get you vexed enough, vexed up enough to buy it, you will pay me money. That money I can use to relieve myself of vexation. So this is like yin and yang. It always works in balance. When my vexation is reduced, someone else's vexation has to increase. So the world is in balance again. Beautiful, isn't it? It's a genius. Whoever invented this world is genius. I'm almost beginning to accept that there is a supreme being somewhere. Because it's so masterfully planned. It's all in balance. Right? I, have a, I, need to, I need somewhere to live. So I need a mortgage and to buy a house. So I need money. I go find a job. And my job is manufacturing cars. So how do I make money out of manufacturing cars? I've got to sell this car to somebody. People are only going to buy my car if they like the car that I make. So then I have to go and get them to do what? Vex. I'm going to have to go and talk to them. I'm going to, I'm going to, go to, I'm going to have to go and advertise my car to them. Hey, this car, this goes really fast. Powerful car. Look at the colors. Look at the spoiler. Look at all the options. Brand new seatbelt. Never been used. Made in Sri Lanka. Second hand. Never been used. Do you want it? Of course I want it. Right. This much money. The guy pays you money. You take the money. Go and get a mortgage. For the deposit. Get the house. Now you're relieved of a vexation. But someone else is in vexation. That's how it works. In balance. So if you're telling me, I want to hang around. I want to be around. I just want to live in this world. I want to be happy. What you're saying is, I'm okay with someone vexing me to relieve themselves of their vexation. That's what you're telling me. I'm okay to vex, to relieve someone else of their vexation. It's like donation, like blood donation. If someone needs, it's like there's a, there's a, there's a finite amount of blood. Right? When someone else needs blood, well, someone else has to donate blood. You can't make blood. You have to give blood. So if someone's in vexation, to relieve your them of vexation, you have to go into vexation. That's how the world works. Are you okay with that? You want to hang around? All those ornaments you have at home? Hmm? All those ornaments? The grand piano? The cuckoo clock? The flower vase, the pot puri, the lovely chandelier. I know you've got one of those. I know. How did they make their way to your home? Into your home? Vexation, indeed. You looked at them, you look at it and thought, ooh, I want that. Why? You were influenced. How? You hung around with the wrong crowd. The reason you have a chandelier at home today is because you hang around with the wrong crowd. You think it's so innocent, right? It's only a chandelier. How can you say I'm hanging around with the wrong crowd? Well, they had one. They got one. Why? Because they were infected. This is like a zombie ac apocalypse. And one zombie bites another guy. The guy gets infected. And then what does he do? He goes and bites another one. And then they get infected. And then they just keep on going. It's like it's, like it's the pyramid effect. 
There's one source, that's all it's needed. And then the one guy infects two, then two infects four, four infects eight, that's how it goes. So if you have a chandelier at home, that's why I asked you the other day, are you, are you willing to take me home and show me around? <laughs> the state that your home is in right now, are you willing to take me to your place and show me around your living room? Oh, come on in, Swami, and say, look at all the lovely ornaments that we have at home. Knowing fully well how I feel about you. Knowing fully well how, I, how much I know that these are all crying out loud that you are vexing. Would you like to take me and show me your garden? <laughs> Come on, on your gardeners. Aren't you proud of your garden? The, the roses, hmm? red and yellow. The tulips, the daffodils, the sunflowers, surrounded by the green grass. And then there's that pond with the water lilies. Hmm? When would you like to invite me? Take me to your place and show me around. Are you a proud housewife? Are you a proud homeowner? You show me your flowers, I see what? Vexation. You show me your aquarium. Fish tank. I see what? Vexation. You show me your cuckoo clock. I see what? Vexation. The bird comes out and goes, Cuckoo, I hear what? Vexing. You show me your Da Vinci painting. I see what? Vexation. You show me your collections. Elton John collection. Michael Jackson collection. You show me your trilogies, right? The Matrix trilogy. Hmm? Star Wars. You show me, you show me, oh, you know, night neatly laid out on your shelves, all those box sets, right? Laid out. Your large screen TV, 65 inch. Hmm? You show me these things. What do I see? Vexation. So, who wants to take me home first? Well, you don't want to invite me to your place? God, you're an evil bunch, aren't you? I used to be proud of my home. Now I'm ashamed. As in, not the home I'm in now, but the home I used to be in. I'm ashamed. Because every item, every item that was not essential for my existence, I brought there because I was vexing. Even the items that are there, that are there, that are essential. The fridge, yeah, an essential item. But why is it there in the first place? Why do I need a fridge? Because I need to keep my food from going off. Why do I need that? Because I need food. Why do I need food? Because I have a stomach that gets hungry. Why do I have a stomach? Because I have to maintain and sustain a body. Why do I have that? Because I need sight, sound, smell, taste and touch. Why? Because I want to see. I want to smell. In other words, I'm vexing. <clears throat> if you can perfect this, folks, when you walk into your home, as you open the door and look inside, practice this. You know, this is practicing meditation in your home. You don't have to come to the monastery for that. You can sit in your bedroom. Get, find yourself a comfortable position to sit in, you know, get yourself a cushion or a chair or whatever. Sit on the bed if you want and look around your bedroom. Scan it. Every item that you see, you know, like they say, I see with my, was it? With my little eyes, yes. Thank you. I see with my little eyes. And you look around the room. A 65-inch Sony television. Now ask yourself, how did it get there? The answer is not, I went to the showroom, paid money and brought it home. That's not what I'm looking for. Really, in fact, what I'm more interested in is, why did it get there? Not how did it get there. Why did it get there? 
Why do you have a TV? The answer is because I want to watch TV. Why do you want to watch TV? Because you believe that what you're being shown are sights and sounds which are pleasurable, joyful and essenceful. In other words, you're ignorant. So really, next time someone comes around and says, you want to, you want to show them, hey, look at my new TV, I'm so ignorant. <laughs> what about my 5.1 surround sound? You can give it in a surrounding way, like I'm so ignorant, 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 ignorant. <laughs> now give the full sound effect. I'm so ignorant. Then you take them into your bedrooms and then show them, you know, show them around, right? Do you like the carpet? I picked this carpet because I'm so ignorant. And the wall hangings, show them each one of them. I'm so ignorant, I got this one. And then I got another one. Can you imagine how ignorant I am? And then it was buy to get one free. I got this one as well. So if you are two times ignorant, they give you one for free. See, you don't have to come here to meditate. You can do your meditation at home. Because meditation is nothing other than contemplating on the truth. Reflecting on the truth. Scanning, perusing each item you have at home and asking the story. Asking your story, your jatake. How did they come into being? Jatiya. This is your jatake. Each one of those items have a jataka, jataka story. It's not just the Buddha who had jataka story. Each item you have in your home has a jataka story. What is a jataka story? How did it come into being? How? Find out the answer. Open your fridge. Oh, there's plenty. There's the cheese singles and the triangles and the pizza left over from last night. Hmm? The chicken curry from last night. The burgers in the freezer. Sausages, meatballs, right? ice cream. Leftover, you know, curries from last night. Look at all of them. The Fanta bottle. Cake. Ask yourselves, why did each one of those things come into my fridge? Why? 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 This is contemplation. This is what meditation is. You don't have to sit down, cross-legged, and then reflect on some karma stan. This is all you have to do. Ask yourself, why did these things come into my home? Get your children to do this. Get them one day to lay out their toys in front of them. Right, Buddha, sit down. Now, each of these toys, you need to ask yourself, why did this come into my, into my bedroom? Why did that Lego set come into my bedroom? Why did that X-Man figurine come into my bedroom? Why do I have a Superman in my bedroom? Why do I have a Batman poster in my bedroom? Why did Sanat Jai Surya come up in my bedroom? Ask these questions. Why? 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 And the kids have these questions, right? Why? They never stop, right? Why? Ami, why did Mali come? Because he just did. Why? Because Ami and Tati decided to bring him. Why? Because they had one a spare. Why? He's like, shut up. <laughs> one day you will know. Why? Be like a kid. Keep asking why. And see if you can link it all back to the root problem of wanting and desire. Do you know that each of the items you have at home, each of these possessions that you have, have the potential to take away your peace, your peace of mind. Each one of those things bring you fear and worry. Why did you take out home and contents insurance? Is it not because of fear and worry? If you smell smoke at home, how does that make you feel? Worried? Fear? If the fire alarm goes off, how does that make you feel? Fear and worry? Why all these lovely things that you have, all your material possessions going up in flames? 
fear. There's only one cause for fear, and that is attachment, desire, wanting, wanting. Some of you may have parents who are get into their last legs of life in their lives. Last few years. For some of you it may be your spouses. Perhaps they're weak, they're frail, they're too ill. Perhaps they're on the this may be the last year that they'll see. They probably won't be around come twenty twenty. See, the, the moment I say this, I can see how your faces change. It's amazing. See, I, I speak of an event. It's not an if. I speak of a when event, not an if event. I speak of death and your faces change. Why does it do that? Why does that do? Why does the word death change you, your face your emotions change. Your smiles turn into a frown. Fear. Worry. Because you have the fear of losing. You're worried about losing something you love. You fear loss. Why do you fear? Because you're attached. Because you want them to be with you. You want them to be around. You want them to be alive. Why do you want them? Because you want the sights and the sounds and the smells and the tastes and the touch that come from them to keep coming. Because you expect those things to make you happy. Expecting again, once again, have expectation is the cause of all suffering. You're expecting outwardly things to make you happy. But they never did. They never did. They don't. And they never will do. All it brings is suffering. That's why I say, you know, some people, they, when, they, when they get to learn that they got cancer, the next day they're at the monastery. What a shame. How many times have people come up to me and ask them, I've never seen you before, sir. Why are you here? I've got cancer. I know, it's funny. It really is, actually. It's, it's, it's not funny and funny at the same time. Why are you here? Because I've got cancer. You got on the wrong bus. The bus to Maharagama is the other way. No, seriously. Because they're coming here for the wrong problem. They want to live. Now they've been given an expiry date. Right? The expiry date has been pronounced. Essentially, that's what it is. It's like, on this day you shall be sent to the gallows. So the, the death penalty has been announced. Now they want to come here because they know that death is now imminent. So until this death sentence came along, they thought, what? I'm never going to die. So they kept fooling themselves. I'm not going to die. Not anytime soon anyway. That's why whenever we have a meditation program or a seal program, it's always the elderly people that come to the monastery, right? Because young people, they're far too busy. Why? They're not going to die. It's only the old people that die. Only old people die, right? Young people, they don't die. Old people die. Old people die. Young people don't die. So young people needn't worry. No, this is, you know, you, it's been so indoctrinated in our minds, this way of thinking, which is flawed. Now, I've told you, when I asked my mother, can I ordain? She said, why so soon? Because what is, the, what is the idea that they have in their minds? Ordaining is for what? Which people? Old people. After you've lived a good life, after you've had kids, right? after you've become successful, then you retire and then you go and ordain.
That's the time to ordain. When you have made use of your life towards useless things. It's the chaff that goes to the to go to ordain. This is the mentality that people have. Because again, they have not seen the right problem. That's all it is. That's all it is. You haven't seen the right problem. My parents didn't see the problem. I don't know if, if they have seen it now, but they didn't. Certainly not when they gave me up. I mean, it's great of them to have given me up even when they hadn't seen the problem. That's remarkably great of them. So I'm really grateful that they did that. But ever since, I'm trying to help them to figure out the real problem. Just as much as I'm trying to help you all figure out the real problem. So parents, you know, it's not when you're old you need to come and see the problem. You've got to see it now. Because this problem of wanting is there right from the start. When you grow old, there are lots of things you want, but now you can't. People think that's the problem. Like, I want to go watch the movie, but the, the, the cinema, but I'm too old, I can't get out of bed now. So people think, ah, now I'm suffering. No, no, no. You suffered the day you wanted to see the movie. That's when problems started. That's when the problems started. That's the problem that has to be realized. See, the thing is, now they're 60, 65, 70. They can hardly stay awake when we actually start talking to them. So how are they going to figure out the problem? It's too late for some of them. It's too late. Because if they don't have the need to do it, if they don't have the, uh, the ambition to do it, if they don't have the... You know, some, some people, they just, they just come for it, just come for the ride. Maybe for the lunch, I don't know. Just come for the sake of it. I don't think it's ever too late if you have, if you're coming for the right purpose, for the right reason. There were arahants in the Buddhist ministry who became arahants at a very late stage in their life. I mean, Asaji, the first, uh, so it's uh, Venerable Sariputta's teacher. He was old aged when he gave, when he taught when he gave his sermon to Venerable Sariputta. There were plenty of monks who became arahants even in, in later parts of stages of their lives. But the sooner you start this, the better. And the sooner that you realize the problem, the better. Because now you can fix the problem, the real problem. The real problem is wanting, the real problem is desire. Desire is the problem, wanting is the problem. So make this practical, folks. Okay, it's it's it, it, this is as I always say, this is twenty percent theory, but eighty percent practice. You have plenty of opportunity at home to practice this. This is why I say, you know, at home, the next time something makes you angry, ask yourself, which way am I pointing my finger now? If you point your finger outwards, that's ten rupees in the piggy bank. If you actually say something out loud. Because someone else made you angry, 20 rupees in the piggy bank. If you actually lift a finger, 30 rupees in the finger bank. And children, you can get your parents to do this. Tati, you got angry in the morning. Maybe wait till evening. Otherwise he's going to have to put about a thousand rupees in, in one go. <laughs> because he's going to spank you until you go red hot. <laughs> so maybe wait until he calms down. And in the evening, remind him that you got angry in the morning. 30 rupees, please. You know, seriously, come up with a way to penalize Ragadvesha Moha at home. That's how to do it. Come up with a way at your, in, your, in your home to penalize desire, aversion and delusion. I mean, delusion is, is, is harder to spot. But anger is the easiest one out of them to spot. And secondly, desire. If someone says that, right, so let's say you go shopping. 
Ami says, oh, look at that lovely wall hanging. Now what should everyone else say? Yes, 20 rupees. Why? She didn't just think it, she said it out loud. What did she say? Lovely wall hanging. Is there such a thing as a lovely wall hanging? No. That's 20 rupees. Ami, when we get home, 20 rupees in the piggy bank, please. You know, come up with a way to penalize the defilements. Pinocchio, what happened to him every time he lied? His nose grew longer. That's how we learned I shouldn't lie. There's a penalty system. So, have a penalty system. Faragadesha Moha. If your kids ask for pizza tonight, there's dinner. Dinner is ready. Ami, can we have pizza tonight, please? So he didn't just think about it, he said it out loud. Now, 20 rupees in the till, please. 20 rupees. 20 rupees out of pocket money from lunch tomorrow. So, you can, now he's got a choice. Do I sacrifice 20 rupees out of my pocket money or do I ask for pizza? But now he knows that there's a cost to it. Isn't that the truth? Every time you desire something, isn't there a cost to it? This is the Adina. The consequences. Are you not all experiencing the cost of desire? What is old age, if not the cost of desire? What is the pain of disease, if not the cost of desire? What is a toothache, if not the cost of desire? Isn't that the cost of desire? You desired something, as in you wanted something, so you had to be born to achieve it, and now you have to suffer from a toothache. A toothache. What, a, what is a backache, if not, a, if not the cost of desire? These are the consequences of desire. So teach your children that there's a cost. There's a cost. So you have to now make a cost-benefit analysis. Is it worth the cost? Is it worth the cost? Do I ask for pizza? Or do I just keep my mouth shut and save my 20 rupees? And when the pizza arrives, if they actually want a slice out of it, now it's 30 rupees. Why? Because it didn't stop at Vachi Karma. It went on to Kaya Karma. So child says, Ami, can I play the PlayStation? So he didn't just ask for it. He thought about it and asked for it. So 20 rupees. And now he wants to play it. Okay, 30 rupees, please. Put the money in the piggy bank and now you can play. So that money has to come out of, the, out of pocket money. Okay, what if you don't give your children pocket money? That's fine. Get them to do chores at home and earn their money. I mean, if you don't ordain your kids, they're going to have to earn money anyway, right? So teach them. Teach them at a young age. You've got to earn a living. I think one of, the, one, of the, one of the worst things that parents can do for their children is not teach them that you've got to earn your way in life. <clears throat> so even from a young age, teach them to earn a living. Now give them pocket money for sweeping the house, washing the dishes, cleaning the toilet. Teach them that money drawn, grown trees, you've got to work for it and then they will appreciate your hard work, your labor. They'll start to appreciate that my, my parents must be working really damn hard to be able to feed us and clothe us and give us shelter and take us to the hospitals and pay my tuition fees. Geez, if I have to clean the toilet like three times a week to earn myself 10 rupees, then for my mother to be paying me a thousand rupees for my maths tuition class, how much hard work must it be? They're going to now start to think about this. <clears throat> I don't believe in keeping money away from children. No. Teach your children how to earn money. 
teach your children the value of money. And by teaching that, really, it's not about money, the value of which you're teaching them. Teaching them. Teach them that the equity of life is labor. Labor is the equity of life. Teach them that to gain something, you have to work for it. Then they will appreciate how hard their parents work. Today, a lot of the time, people come up to me and say, Swami Nasa, my children, they don't understand how hard we work for them. <clears throat> they ask for this, that and the other. My children are always pestering me to get me that, get me this tati, get me that tati. They don't appreciate how hard we have to work for it. No, it's because you, don't, you didn't teach them. So teach them. You know, from a young age, about the age of seven, eight, nine, right? They will start, they can count. They know their money, right? Then they'll be able to figure out currencies and how to count money. They'll, they'll be able to learn that. So give them some pocket money. But get them to do something before you give them that. Not for free. Don't give them pocket money for free. Get them to work for it. Do you get a free lunch? Adults, parents, do you get free lunches? No, you work for it, right? So teach your children to work for their money. Work for their lunch. If you give them pocket money to eat, at lunch, eat lunch from school, get them to work for it. Clean the toilet and I will give you money for tomorrow's lunch. Sweep the kitchen and I'll give you money for tomorrow's lunch. That's how you ought to bring, bring up children. If I had children, that's how I would bring them up. No, seriously. Now they have money to put into the piggy bank. See, one bird, two stones. No, the other way around. One stone, two birds. So now you give them a worldly lesson as well as a lesson that is going to help them towards the Nibbana also. The worldly lesson is money don't grow on trees. You have to work hard for your money. So even if they don't come and ordain, that will see them through. That will see them well. And then whenever they see hard-working people, they'll appreciate that. It doesn't matter how, how rich you are. It doesn't matter how well off you are as a family, as parents. Always teach your children that you've got to earn a living. Things you don't get for free. Because the world's not like that. Did you get anything for free? Hmm? Did you get anything for free? No. That's how you spoil children. By giving them things for free. If they want to play on the PlayStation, good. Sweep the kitchen first. Now you can play. I'm going to go play cricket this weekend. Okay. But first, clean your bedroom. Not until then. You hate me now? Now this is how my, my father taught me. I remember how much I had to cry in front of him for a bicycle. How many exams I had to get through just to get a bicycle. Every year he said, yeah, you get one this year. But the year came and went, no bicycle. For the following year, he said, okay, get through the next exam and I'll get you the bike. Got through the exam, just no bike. Not because he couldn't afford one, but he wanted to teach me the value of money. He wanted to teach me the value of hard work and labor. My father could drive me to school every day, but he didn't. He got me to go in the bus. He got me to get public transport because he wanted to teach me a lesson. <clears throat> he wanted to expose me to society, to learn how to live life, to learn how to interact with people. So he didn't drive me to school. He could, but he didn't. Even to this day, he reminds me, do you remember Swami Nuhan, so why I didn't drive you to school? Yes, Apache, I remember He's very proud of that. Bless him. He's very proud of the fact that he didn't get me my bike. <laughs> but he says, you know, the reason that you have grown up to become a good child today, to, to, you have grown up to become a good person, is because of how we brought you up. And, and I say, absolutely. Hats off. Yes, that is true. Otherwise, I would have grown up not appreciating. <clears throat> not appreciating 
hard work. So I didn't live a life of laziness and that's not the life that I got used to. I wanted I started working hard from as, as from a young age as early as I could remember. So anyway, the point I'm trying to make is penalize Ragadvesha Mohan. Okay? So parents, of course, you can put your money into the tills, but children, if they don't have money, then come up with a method. And this is the method that I suggest. Either that, or if you really don't want to give them money, here's what you can do. Have little chits of paper, okay, small bits of paper, and say if your child's name is Shehan, Shehan. Instead of putting 10 rupees, you can put in uh, 15 minutes. Roll it up and put it into the tail. If it's uh, Vachi Karma, 30 minutes into the tail. If it's Kaya Karma, 45 minutes into the tail. What is this time? This is time. Time that they have to now put towards the Sambuddha Shasani. So when you invite the monks to your home or when you offer, go, to the, go to offer the dane, instead of money, well, they can give time. So Buddha, let's take up all the chits. Okay, so in the last three months you have 15, 15, that's 30, another 15, that's 45, all together. That's three and a half hours, right? For this dane, you have to expend three and a half hours of your time towards the dhani. So then give him some work, three and a half hours worth of work, washing the dishes, washing the monk's feet as they walk into your home, hmm? laying out the chairs, arranging the dhani, washing the, the, the arms bowls. Right? So now instead of money, they have to give up time. Either way, they are being penalized for Ragadesha Moha. But at the same time, they're also earning merits. What a fantastic way. So implement that method at home. So stop pointing the finger outwards. Always point the finger inwards. There's no one who's ever made you angry. No one. Only you have always made yourself angry. No one's ever made you feel sad. You have made yourself feel sad. No one's ever irritated you or annoyed you. You irritated yourself. You annoyed yourself. You are your greatest annoyance. Accepting that is the start of this journey. First, you've got to accept that I have a problem. Then we can start working on it. If you don't accept you have a problem, you ain't even going to go to see the doctor. Guy's got a stomachache. He doesn't want to admit it. He's not going to go see the doctor. It all starts with accepting. Yes, problems with me. Problems with me. But do you now see the problem? Where where is the root of the problem? With anger. Hmm? Wanting. Wanting is at the root of anger. Whenever you get angry about something, see if you can link it back to what it is that you want. You get a bill, red notice, makes you angry. Why is that? Because what do you want? You want it to not be a red bill. You don't want, you want it to not be a red notice. You get a tax bill, no? Make you, makes you angry, irritates you, annoys you, why? It's because you don't want. You want it to not be your tax bill. You want to not pay tax. You want to not pay bills, not have to pay bills. This is why. You get a parking ticket. You want to not get a parking ticket. Or in other words, you don't want a parking ticket. There's always want. See the want and fix the want. And then that is how you can fix anger. See, I want you all, when I ask you in about, say, three months' time, how about I say, put your hands up, if you have expressed anger physically in the last three months, none of you put your hands up. Wouldn't that be a great achievement? In three months' time, I'll ask you all. In the last three months, have you physically expressed anger? So, not even as 
much as lifting a finger. You have not gone that far. It stopped that vachi. Vachi sankar, as in verbal. Verbally you have expressed it, but not physically. You haven't lifted a finger. You haven't picked up a stick or a cane to hit someone. You didn't pick up something to throw at someone to hit them. Right? So none of you will, children will have had fights at school. Hmm? That has to stop. No fighting. Violence only begets violence. So in three months time, I want you all to be able to say, yes, Swami Nansa, none of us have physically expressed anger. And then a few more months down the line, I'll ask you all, have you verbally expressed anger at someone else? And you will tell me, no, Swami Nansa, I have never, I have not shouted at someone, not in the last six months. Now, wouldn't that be an achievement? I have not shouted at someone. I have not sworn at anyone. I have not expressed anger at anyone. I mean, you can complain, but without being angry. Can you not? I'm not saying don't complain. Like the phone won't work, right? You're paying your bill, but the phone won't work. I'm not saying just keep quiet about it. Ring up the company. Uh, excuse me. The phone's not working. Okay, we'll try to fix it. Please, thank you. You go back the next day, it's still not being fixed. It's not working. Please, can you fix it? You go back the next day, it's still not fixed. Please, can you fix it? At what point is it okay to change your tone? Please, can you fix it? Can you fix it? Fix it! <laughs> At what point is it okay to change your tone? Hmm? It's not. Because if you're changing your tone, you have failed. Again, who's making the mistake? The other guy. Who's suffering? You. So you're doubly penalizing yourself. One, the phone's not working. Two, you're getting angry. Stop penalizing yourself. Is all I'm asking you to do. Stop punishing yourself for someone else's fault. I can't believe I'm actually having to say this. Stop punishing yourself for someone else's fault. It's like you're walking up the street, two guys are having a fight and you think, hey, why are they having a fight? Let me hit myself. I'm saying don't do that. Stop penalizing yourself. You are the architect of your own anger. No one else has ever made you angry. No one. See, anger is a big problem. A lot of people have this problem. And, and anger is, not, is, is worse than desire. Aversion is worse than desire. Because anger, hatred, right? This is a direct path to the hells. No detours. Direct. If in, the, if in your last moment of life you are reminded of an instance in which you were angry and you are not a sotapanna, then sure as hell you will end up in hell. It's, it's a lot worse than desire. So if there are, you know, talking about anger, anger if there are people that you have been angry at or angry with, of people who you have expressed anger towards, right? Maybe you lost your cool sometime, perhaps in, in the last year, maybe two years, in the last three, four, five years. Someone with whom you are angry and that thought just keeps coming back to you all the time, worrying you and you can't sleep at night sometimes, maybe. Or the moment that someone talks about that person. Hey, do you remember Shamila? Oh, yeah, yeah, that girl. And, and, you, and you, that, that your forehead changes to a, changes to a frown immediately. Because of that bad experience you had and you ended that conversation by shouting at that person. I think it's best you repair it. I think it's best you go back and have that conversation. Because you left it, at a, at a, you left it in a very foul state.
Because what if that thought comes back at the moment of your death? We don't know what might trigger it. Perhaps you're really angry with maybe a child of yours. You know, that can happen in families sometimes, right? Children grow up and then they forsake the parents. They go on and they do their own thing, right? Without being obedient to the parents. And sometimes parents, they give up on their children with so much resentment and, and hatred. Not really, but they're really angry with them for what they did. They say, you know, you've, you brought shame on our family. Sometimes, let's say, you know, the daughter runs away with, another, with a guy, right? And then now the family has pretty much disowned this child. And now the anger, that, that, that festering anger is in the, in the mind, in the heart. It's killing you. Literally, it's killing you. Be the better man. Speak to them. Give them a call. Go and see them if you must. Or invite them to come around. Talk to them. Not for their benefit, for your own benefit. Talk to them and say, Puta, yes. You know, we ended things on a, on a really foul note. But let's make, let's make repairs. I, f- I forgive you. Right? Whatever was said and done between us, let's not take it any further. I forgive you. And I was angry back then. I shouted at you. I screamed at you. I yelled at you. I was infuriated. It was wrong of me to be like that. Today I realize that my anger is my own making. It's not what you did that made me angry. I was a fool to be angry at you. So forgive me. You can, do, you can go and do as you wish. This is not me asking you to change what you have decided to do, change your way of life. All I wanted was an, was an opportunity to make repairs. Forgive me, I forgive you. And that's the end of it. At least now, you know, you have made a confession. You have made that confession, now you can move on. You know, think about old friends. You might have left those relationships on a sour note. Used to be old friends, but now you're enemies. It ended in a brawl, in a fight, in an argument. And then that was the last time you spoke to that person. Right, every time, so even as I'm talking about this now, you know who I'm talking about. Yeah, that guy. That person. You know who I'm talking about. That person. Make repairs. Pick up the phone. Talk to them. Send them a note. Send them a letter. If you don't have the courage or if you can't make contact with them over the phone, send them a note. Dear, whatever the name is. Right? Yes, we ended things on a very sour note. I'm not, imp- I'm, not, I'm not proud about how we ended our relationship. It was wrong of me to have shouted at you. Things happened, right? You didn't like the way I acted. I didn't like the way you acted. But today I realized that if I was angry at you, that was not your fault. Do you not agree? If you are angry at someone, whose fault is it? Your own fault. So you say, if I was angry at you and if I shouted at you, that was my own fault. I'm sorry for having expressed my anger or taken out my anger on you. I forgive you. With metta. Sign it, put it in the post. Just try it out once. See how relaxed you will feel after that. How relieved you will feel after that. Because the problem is, if that thought comes back to you in your moment of death, if that memory comes back to you in your moment of death, in, in your moment of death, and if you are not a sotapanna, then I can pretty much guarantee your next stop is not going to be a fun place. So make repairs. It's time to grow. It's time to become the better man, the better person. Be first to apologize. Don't wait for the other guy. I know it may be that they, they're the ones who wronged you. Perhaps they borrowed money off of you and haven't returned it. Perhaps they've taken something that belongs to you and not returned it. And on, on those grounds, you, you don't want to talk to them. You're angry with them. Well, let's make repairs because anger is killing you. They made the mistake, but you're angry. You're suffering. For their error, you're suffering. How does that make sense? Put a stop to it. You're not saying, give give me back my money. No. You can decide to do whatever you want with it. Ultimately, that's what they're doing anyway. 
by not giving it back to you, right? This is not me asking you to pay back the money. You can choose to decide as you see fit. But I just wanted to write to you to say, I'm not angry with you. I have forgiven you for anything that might have happened between us with Netta. Sign it, put it in the post. In fact, chances are they likely to make contact and say, I'll give you back the money. But this is not why you should do it. Okay? This is not a cunning, conniving strategy to get back the money that they owe you. <laughs> Don't use the Dhamma for that. And if, you, if that's what you're doing, don't sign with metta. <laughs> so don't use the Dhamma for your personal gains. But, you know, I think we all should, we all should do something about that. Because right? I know there will be festering wounds in a lot of your hearts and in your minds. It may be, an old, it may be a sibling who you don't keep in contact with anymore. It may, be a, it may be an offspring of yours, right? A son or a daughter. It may be a parent that you just don't keep in touch with anymore. Perhaps an uncle or an aunt or a grandparent. Because those, those relationships ended very sourly, so bitterly. But it's time to move on. Maybe an old friend from school. The last day you saw them, you had a fight, an argument. And that was the end of it. You never spoke with each other. You unfriended them on Facebook, blocked them, and that was it. No, you can be better than that. Because you have been cowardly. That's what you did. By blocking them and saying, don't ever speak to me again, that was being cowardly. No, be the better man. I'm not saying rekindle old relationships. That's not required. That's not necessary. You know, because if you can't, if they can't board with you, then so be it. But it's time to move on. That's all I'm saying. Send them a note. Maybe a postcard. Does it have to be fancy? Just say, I'm sorry for sh having shouted at you. Because you ought to be. You got angry. That's not their fault. What does the finger on me to say? Whose fault is it? My fault. You can really move on if you do this, folks. You will, you will feel the relief in your hearts. Yeah, I was one who could never harbor anger within me. People saw it as a weakness. But today I'm glad that I could do that. I remember one day I was at work. I, I had to... It was in the branch that I was, I was the deputy manager of. And the manager had gone on sick leave or something. Some other guy came in to uh, oversee matters for the day. And it was a really busy day, so I went up and there was something I needed him to sign off. A senior manager had to sign it off, so I took it to the guy and this guy was really, he, was a, he worked in fraud. So, you know, you know what people who work in fraud are like, always so tensed and so stressed out. And right? so this guy, uh, he was so stressed out when I approached him. And he shouted at me. He said, How, why do you bring this rubbish to me? Go and sort your own mess out. So I realized that this is not the time for me to be asking him 10 rupees. So I said, no, okay. And so I walked away and then after the end of the day, I gave him a call and I said, you know, his name was John, I still remember. I said, John, I, perhaps I approached you at a bad time. I'm really sorry if what I did or having spoken to you, coming to you at the wrong time upset you. I'm sorry for what I did. So he's, he didn't expect that. And, you know, he said back, he said back to me, you know, hey, no, it's not your fault, it's my fault. I'm sorry I shouted at you. I shouldn't have done that. But then that, he, he had so much trust in me from that point forward. And, you know, that, that was the start of a, a really great business relationship from that point forward. So, you know, by healing wounds, by being the first to heal a wound, you can, you can really untrust from people. Be the first to apologize. Don't be the second. Don't wait. Be the first to apologize. It could be that they're the, they're the one at fault. But you can still say sorry. You can say sorry for making them feel that way. As I'm saying, says, you know, I'm not saying admit, admit fault for something. If you are not at fault, you don't have to admit fault. That's not what I'm saying. They did something and now they're shouting at you. You haven't done anything. Yes, but you can still say I'm sorry for having made you feel that way. 
So really, you're, you're empathizing with them. I'm sorry for having made you feel that way. You're not saying I'm sorry for what I did. If you know what you did was right, then that's fine. But I'm sorry for having made you feel that way. At least they'll, they'll feel that you're making amends with them. And that'll be the start of a great relationship. In my experience, that's how it's always worked. Be the first to apologize. Because people get angry because of cowardliness. Only cowards get angry. People who have guts, people who are a strong character, they don't get angry. People who lack personality, people who lack integrity, people who lack courage, who lack strength, they're the people who get angry. When was the last time you heard the Buddha got angry? Hmm? What about the great elder Sariputta? When was the last time he got angry? No, they don't get angry. You can't make them angry. Even if you tried it, you couldn't, you couldn't make them angry. So anger is an expression of cowardliness, not bravery. A real man doesn't get angry. There's only a coward that gets angry. So let's work on that. You can start by doing the things I suggested. One, get yourself that piggy bank. Start working on it. Right? If it's not money, at least little chits of paper. You I owe you labor. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. That goes into the jail. And then that, you make an offering to the Mahasangha. It could be a dhani, or it could be some other meritorious deed. Right? Make an offering. So if it's not money, it's labor. You know, if it's 15 minutes in the till, you can come and sweep the temple. Next time you bring your children to the monastery, right? Buddha, let's open the till up. How many chits did you collect in the last week? Uh, there's, there's half an hour, right? Let's go to the monastery. You have to sweep for half an hour. You've got you to gotta clean the chairs. You've got to arrange the, the hall. Right? You've got to go and wash the bathrooms. Right? Someone has to clean those toilets. If you don't do it, we do it. So, if your children have collected up sheets of paper and it has 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, then get them to clean the toilets. How much merit do you think they learn? An incredible amount of merit. That's the way Aryans solve problems. Not by giving them the cane treatment. You don't have to hit your children, folks. You don't have to beat your children. You don't have to. There are other ways to do it. Show them wrong is wrong. But appreciate when they do something right. And then whenever you penalize them, penalize them by getting them to do something that is good for them and for greater mankind. And by doing that, when they do something good, they're earning merit and their, their, their minds and their consciousness is acquiring merits and, it, and it's, it's, it's being powered and transformed into something that is, that is beautiful. And the more times that the mind is doing that, the less that the mind will be prone to actually go back and re-offend. So that is how you ought to bring your children up. I have never brought children up of my own, but I have about 50 of them now that I bring up, so... I know a thing or two about bringing up children. Fifty who? Monks. Of which we have about fifteen young monks. Who he has fifteen children? Hmm? None of you. So, take a lesson from me. So this is how I help our young monks to work on their errors, work on their problems. Okay, I promised to end the sermon at 6 o'clock, so I had better keep to my word, unlike you guys. <laughs> so we're going to work on anger this week, yeah? So I want you, when I ask you next week, you need to have that till, the piggy bank, and you need to, hopefully you won't have anything in it, but I might ask you randomly, Madam, how many, how many rupees have you collected in your piggy bank this week? I might ask you randomly. Okay? So, 10 rupees for Mano Karma, 20 rupees for Vachi Karma, 30 rupees for 
kaya kar. So if you feel anger, if you if you know that you are angry but you haven't expressed anything wordly, now you have to be honest to yourself. 10 rupees. If you have actually said something out loud out of anger, 20. And if you have used your body to express anger, that's 30 rupees. So if it's if for our non-native listeners, you can replace rupees with pounds or dollars or whatever that they will go, "Oh, he said rupees. We don't have rupees here." <laughs> I know what you're like. <laughs> it doesn't matter what it is. It can be ring it or yen or whatever you like, just do it. And make sure your fingerometer is pointing in the right direction. And that's, that's, the, that's the whole uh, aim of the game, right? Make sure you're pointing the finger in the right direction. And what's the other thing we said? Those festering. Wounds deep, deep inside of you, all those past angers, past brawls and arguments that you had, it's time to move on. So make up a list of people who you haven't been able to forgive. People who wronged you, people who left you in the lurch. Hmm? Might have been an old relationship, maybe an ex-husband, an ex-wife, maybe. I'm not saying rekindle, I'm not saying get married again. <laughs> That's not for me to say. All I'm saying is, send them a note. I have forgiven you. With metta. If you do that, it will help you grow. It will help you keep a, a, a huge leap on your path to Nibbana. I promise you. Try it. promise you. Okay. Let us now transfer merits that we have all acquired today through the course of this sermon. And by engaging in all the meritorious deeds that you have done throughout the course of the day, first and foremost, let us all take a moment to reflect once upon once again that it is because of the Supreme Buddha that we have the gift of Dhamma today. It is because of him, of his infinite compassion towards all sentient beings, including you and I, that we have the path to our deliverance today, laid out clearly and in front of us. It is because of his selfless dedication and commitment throughout an infinitely long journey in Sansara. Let us also take a moment to transfer merits to the Bhikkhu Bhikkhuni Supasaku Pasikas, who since time immemorial protected and preserved the teaching of the Buddha and passed it down to us in the form of the Tripitaka and in the form of the noble lineage. It is thanks to them that today you and I are able to study the text, to analyze it, to understand, to comprehend it, and to be able to attain the noble attainments. May they all rejoice in the merits that we have all acquired today. Let us also take a moment to transfer merits to all members of the Maha Sangha, resident wherever they may be throughout the world. These are men and women who have dedicated their lives to practice in the path and to seek in their liberation, but have also put time aside towards the liberation of all sentient beings men and women just like you and, I, and you and I. May they all be able to rejoice in the merits that we have all acquired today. Not forgetting for a moment about the monks and nuns who are resident in your local temples and your local nunneries. Although you have come here along today to make offerings, to listen to the Dhamma, do not forget for a moment that it is the monks and nuns resident in your local temples and nunneries in your villages and in your local towns and localities who have always been by your side through thick and thin, come rain or shine, it is there you send your children to the Hampasa and so on and so forth. May they all be able to rejoice in the merits that we have all acquired today. May through the power of these merits, if any of them have been born in the woeful plains, be able to redeem themselves and be born in the blissful plains. And may through the power of these merits, they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us take a moment to transfer merits to the Devas, Brahma, spirits, demons, and the dead that we invited at the start of this sermon. May they have witnessed this meritorious deed and acquired due merit. May through the power of all the merits that we have all acquired today, if any of them have been born in the woeful plains, they will redeem themselves and be born in the blissful plains. And may through the power of these merits, they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also transfer merits to our parents who perhaps are among the living or perhaps who have predeceased us, as well as our ancestors. Mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, nephews, nieces, grandparents, and so on and so forth, as well as your co-workers, your colleagues, friends, among others. Those who have taken on your duties and responsibilities, at least temporarily, so that you are able to be here today. 
They have relieved you of your duties and responsibilities so that you could be present here today. May they be able to rejoice in the merits that we have all acquired today. Let us also transmit it to anyone and everyone who might have helped make this event a success, who have made your presence here today possible and feasible, either by tra providing you with transport or perhaps by offering you with a meal or perhaps by ushering you to a seat or perhaps by giving you a glass of water, just making your comfortable here, making your stay here as comfortable as possible, as well as dissipating the Dhamma throughout the world such that it has, it has reached you over the internet as well as other media such as printed media and transliterating these sermons and making this available to the mass to the masses. May they all be able to rejoice in the merits that we have all acquired today. May through the power of these merits they be able to abstain from non-meritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble late fall path and attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer merits to all the men and women who might have lost their lives in the wars that we have had in Sri Lanka over a period of 30 long years. The members of the armed forces as well as the police force who sacrificed their lives on, on many occasions to protect and preserve the peace and harmony of this country, as well as men and women who might have lost their lives in the wars and in, the, in, and in various battles, be their friend or foe, as well as men and women who might have lost their lives in natural calamities such as the tsunamis, earthquakes, hailstorms, so on and so forth, not just in this country but also in other parts of the globe. Reminding ourselves for a moment that each and every one of them will have at some point in Sansara been a mother to us. Each and every one of them will have at, at least at one point in Sansara been a father to us. So, with infinite metta in our hearts, let us transfer the merits that we have all acquired to all of them. May through the power of these merits, if any of them have been born in the woeful plains, may they be redeemed. May, be, may they be able to redeem themselves and be born in the blissful plains. And may through the power of these merits, they abstain from their meritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. There's also transfer merits to those men and women who have dedicated their lives to leading this country, to protecting our country, to safeguarding it and have dedicated their lives towards the development and prosperity of this country. It is because they have set aside time in their lives to do such activities. You and I have been freed up to put time towards our liberation, our deliverance and our salvation. May they be able to rejoice in the merits that we have all acquired today and may through the power of these merits they abstain from our meritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path and attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And finally, May through the power of all the merits that we have all acquired today, in making offerings to the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha, in listening to this sermon, in preaching this sermon, in making this event accessible and available to all those who have been able to come along, as well as listen to these sermons online, not just today, but also access these sermons in any time in the future, be able to transfer these merits to all those men and women just like yourselves, living throughout the world, who have dedicated their lives to practicing the path and seeking their deliverance to be able to do so. And may through them we be able to witness the advent of many hundreds of thousands of Arahatun Vahanses and Arahat Mehenin Vahanses in our very lives itself and, this, and in the era of the Gautama Supreme Buddha itself. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And finally, may you and I and everyone and anyone who will have contributed towards the success of this event, either through monetary means or perhaps through labor or at least by putting their hands together and passing on their blessings in the form of a sadhu, be able to rejoice in those merits and be able to become one of those arhatun mahanses, be able to become one of those arhat mehinin mahanses in this life itself and the era of the Gautama Supreme Buddha itself. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. The members of the Mahasangha will now transfer their blessings to you. May I and all beings in all worlds be freed from the fires of desire May I and all beings in all worlds be freed from the fires of aversion. May I and all beings in all worlds be freed from the fires of delusion. May I and all beings in all worlds attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. May the noble triple gem be with you all forever. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.